It's the Mixed Martial Arts Hour with... The Mixed Martial Arts Hour is back in your life. On this Wednesday, September 8th, 2021. Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to the program. I missed you on Monday. You know, I haven't been in this chair for all that long. The return has only been a few weeks. And, uh, you know, we did, what, six shows? And I didn't do the Monday show because of Labor Day. Also because of Rosh Hashanah. Shana Tova to all my friends out there. In fact, today is the second day of Rosh Hashanah. Here I am. So never question my dedication to this program. Um, in any event, I, I missed the show on Monday. I felt empty and it's been seven days since our last show. And so I'm kind of jonesing. I feel like a caged animal. I feel like I'm ready to go. I also feel a little naked, if I'm being honest. I don't have my pencil. I don't have anything in my hands. And someone asked me recently, uh, they saw the pencil uh, make a cameo on the Showtime broadcast. I don't know if you guys heard. I was on the Jacob Tyron Woodley broadcast on Showtime around uh, nine, ten days ago. Um, in any event, someone asked me why do you, you know, hold on to the pencil? And you know, it all kind of started in the pandemic, as you know. Chael would make fun of me, and uh, I think DC did a little bit. But if I'm being honest, it was you know the kids were at home homeschool all that stuff and uh, there were a lot of pencils around and it kind of reminded me of being a kid you know a kid in elementary school and you're using that number two pencil and it's sort you know it's sort of a reminder to stay level-headed grounded but also as a sign to my little ones at home that pencil you know you can you can always rock the fancy you know five hundred dollar pen or you know i don't know how expensive a pen goes to you. but you know there's those fancy gold ones and all that anyone could do that on a broadcast but not everyone rocks a number two pencil like we did back in the third grade and so that's what i rock but i left it at home and i was just at a store and i thought to myself i'm gonna get you know 10 or so new ones and i didn't do it and now here i am naked i'm gonna start to market my own so stay tuned for that in any event um that's 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 me sharing my feelings with all of you guys. That's me putting my heart out on my sleeve, as I am known to do. And uh, what a great response. Wow, what a great response uh, after last week's show. You know, it seems like a lot of you are enjoying this new era of the program. Dare I say, this new era of me enjoying independent Helwani, enjoying Heelwani. It's not a gimmick, just for the record. It's a lifestyle. It's a mindset. Each and every one of you has a little Heelwani in you as well, just to let you know, in case you don't know. But I appreciate the positive feedback, the reinforcement. And I know a lot of you want to hear me respond to uh, to Brendan, uh, that, that, that very thoughtful and, uh, you know, just well-constructed uh, breakdown of the past week or so that he had uh, yesterday, I do believe, on his show. I know a lot of you... Uh, want me to respond to it, but you know, I'm, I'm not going to go there. Um, it's just, you know, what's the point, you know, let's move on. Bygones be bygones, water under the bridge. Uh, I, I hope I'm not disappointing anyone when I uh, reveal this, but uh, it's just, what's the point, right? It's just like, what, like, what am I doing? You know, we're going to keep going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, uh, like some kind of ping pong match. I don't think any of you want to hear that. So no response out of me today oh what's that oh that's right oh that's right high road elwani is dead i forgot i said last week i proclaimed that he is dead of course i'm gonna respond to tweedledee and tweedledum later on in the program but they're going to the back of the bus later in the program because we have more important things to talk about at the top of the show. I mean, look, I it was amazing. I didn't expect anything better than that. In fact, my expectations were actually lower than that. So dare I say they exceeded expectations. But I mean, I'm reminded of the great Dennis Green, the late great Dennis Green, who once famously said about the Chicago Bears after a Monday night game, they are who we thought they were. Remember that famous line? They are who we thought they were. I mean, come on. 
Golly, at, at this point, it almost doesn't even feel fair at this point. But of course, Hiawani responds at the end of the program. So stay tuned for that. We shall also be taking your questions. We shall also be uh, going on the Substack page. So if anyone has written anything to us, uh, stay tuned for that. I, uh, I can't imagine what you're asking me about. I can't imagine what's on your mind. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to that very much. I'm also looking forward to the MMA Hour debut of one Ian Gary. Wow. Everyone's so excited about the future. Ian Gary, who, if I'm being honest, in my Heelwani state of mind, was actually supposed to come on and break the news that he is fighting Jordan Williams on November 6th at Madison Square Garden in his highly anticipated UFC debut. Lo and behold, on my way to the studio, my old friend Pete Carroll sends me a text with the news already out there. So it kind of feels like a bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of a, a bait and switch, if I'm being honest. But nevertheless, I actually asked him to be on the show last week without even knowing that there was a fight. It doesn't really matter to me. I'm not, I'm not, I don't live in that lane, B. I don't live in that lane. I'm not in the news breaking lane. I mean, come on. Don't be so sensitive, Helwani. <clears throat> Helwani, don't be so sensitive. Uh, in any event, I'm not sensitive. I'm not upset. I'm excited to have Ian Gary on. It's going to be a great time with a guy who a lot of people think is going to be the next big thing coming out of Ireland in the world of the ultimate fighting championship. Speaking of the next big thing, I mean, we've been having Patty Pimblett on this program for years now. When was the first time? 2017? 2016? When was the first time? He's even been in this studio. He's even been in this studio right here. And people are like, Patty Pimble, Patty, stop having this Cage Warriors guy on. Stop having this Cage Warriors guy on. Now look at us. Now look at him. Everyone talking about him. He's on every show. He's got a gazillion Instagram followers. He was successful in his UFC debut on Saturday. What a great scene that was at the Apex in Las Vegas. Patty Pimble will join us on the program later on today. We'll also be joined by the lone non-European, scheduled to be on today's show, Anthony Leinhardt Smith. Smith, He's fighting Brian Spann on September 18th, main event, uh, one of my favorites in the game. The best texter in MMA. He's the only one who uses punctuation in his text. Like, he'll say, okay, period. A little weird if you ask me, and I've actually called him out on it, but it's like, hi, Anthony, how are you? I am good, period. What? Who, who, who puts a period there? Like, we're quick here. We're quick. We're texting. We're flowing. We're going back and forth. Anthony, phenomenal texter. Punctuation on point. Tom Aspinall is going to join us. Big win for him. Uh, he is looking great in the heavyweight division. Uh, Molly McCann is going to join us as well. I can't wait. I mean, it was just all feel good, except for the main event, of course. Darren Till lost the main event. But all the other big name um, European slash British fighters, Modestus Bukaskis. I'm, I'm still not quite sure, like, is England... Own claiming claiming Modestus or not? I, I'm not sure. PT says they are, so okay. He lost, but for the most part, they had four big wins. Molly, Tom Aspinall, Patty Pimlet, and of course, the still undefeated Jack Shore. And so let us start with the pride of Wales, the one and only Jack Shore, who is kind enough to join us via the magic of Zoom. Mr. Jack Shore... There he is. Yes, How are you? Real. How are you, my friend? I'm good. What's going on? How are you? I'm doing great. Boy, I felt the wrath of the great Richard Shore last week, <laughs> uh, your father and head coach, who felt like I was not giving you enough love heading into your return fight in the UFC. I was a little afraid. So I just want to let you know and let Richard know I am sorry, Mia culpa. This will never happen again. You are, and you don't need to be on my radar, but you are firmly on the radar right now, my friend. Congratulations on the great win. Yes, thank you. He's, uh, you have to bear with him, Ariel. He's, uh, he's stressed out fight week. He's, um, <laughs> he's awful irritable. And he's getting even worse in his old age. So uh, I'm sure he'll accept your apology. No problem at all. And, you know, I was talking about how a lot of the uh, Cage Warriors alumni, as of late, hadn't been faring well in the UFC. And that's I love Cage Warriors. They're the best, in my opinion, regional. And that's not a knock, but like European, American, they're the best of the best. And they have produced some of the greatest fighters in the history of the sport. I just said as of late... And honestly, I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, you know, I, I didn't mention you. That was, the, I think I mentioned you later on. I didn't mention Tom. That was my fault. Anyway, Richard called me out 
Fair play. He deserved to call me out. That's my bad. Let's talk about what happened on Saturday. Great win. Another great win for you. Still undefeated. But man, oh man, you're banged up. Are you you got the cast on? There got it the is. Cast on. Jeez, look, what do you got? Broken thumb and an injured shoulder? Yeah, so um broken thumb. I think I did that in the the first round. And to be honest, I think it happened from because my shoulder was I was in so much pain throwing with the shoulder. I wasn't throwing my left up tidy. I couldn't couldn't get my, my elbow enough, and um, I've ended up obviously cracking him with uh, with the side of my hand and uh, completely snapped my thumb at the base. So Jeez. I'm six weeks in a cast with that now, and um, waiting on an MRI scan next week to to see the the full extent of the damage on the shoulder. So considering it was a it was a pretty straightforward victory it's probably the most um banged up i've been coming out of a fight to be honest how close were you to pulling out of a, of the fight um so the the shoulder initially happened about two and a half weeks before the fight and the first sort of two or three days after the injury happened it was it was horrendous with the pain i couldn't couldn't lift my arm couldn't could, i had no movement i couldn't even get on the treadmill without uh without any pain so we, we were close um but obviously, because it's such a big card in terms of the UK talent and a lot of eyes on it, I, I didn't really want to pull. I'd had a lot of adversity with opponent changes and, and stuff like that. And I just thought if, if I can go out there, get to, to Vegas early, make use of the PI and, and sort of see if they can get my arm in a situation and, and a position where I can you know, even use it at 50%. I wanted to make sure I could get out there and fight. So my coaches were monitoring me closely. They, they wanted me to pull, but... Um, St stubborn as ever, I, I, I sort of put my foot down. I was like, look, I'm, I'm going out there. And obviously when I was in Vegas, there was no way I was ever going to pull once uh, once I was out there anyway. But uh, look, looking back, obviously it could have gone wrong. But thankfully, you know, we made it through. Uh, and mentally, what was it like? Like at any point in the fight, were you like, oh my gosh, this is more pain than I've ever experienced in a fight before. I'm sure adrenaline is pumping. You're feeling good. You're trying to get the W. But just the mental hurdle of trying to fight, not only then with the injured shoulder, but the injured thumb as well. What was that like for you? Yeah, it was tough. Like, obviously, I had the uh, the arm triangle in the first round. And I thought, right, this might be my chance now to, to to get a quick win and obviously get out here before before the shoulder goes. But as soon as I started squeezing, like I could feel it. Um, and then as soon as I went back to the corner at the end of the first round, the pain was just getting worse and worse as as the fight was going on. Every jab I was throwing, it, it was getting more restricted. The the pain was starting to shoot up into my trap, up into my neck. And I thought, right, we, we've just got to sort of hit cruise control here and just just keep him away from me and, and rack the points up. But it it was you know it's a bad one when uh, when you're feeling the pain and your adrenaline's pumping. You know, usually those sort of things don't start to work till after the fight, like um but by the end of the third, I couldn't clench my fist because of the thumb, and uh, I couldn't lift my arm because of the shoulders. Or so the, the wrestling and the grappling was something I had to avoid dearly. You know, be, being against such a good wrestler as well, it was starting to get a little bit, a uh, little bit edgy in, in the mind towards the end of the second and the third when you start to shoot for takedowns, and because I had no strength against against the kids, I was trying to go right arm heavy. I was, I was struggling to under up, struggling to do anything with uh, with my left arm and my left hand. So. It was a tough one on the mind, but obviously, you know, that's where we got through it and uh, and managed to get a win. Surgery needed? I'm not sure. I've spoke to to a couple of the guys at the PI. I've spoke to a couple of um, of local physiotherapists, and a lot of them are saying if it is the the bicep ten, then it could be surgery. Um, but obviously, I won't know the full extent until um, until I get the MRI done. I'm, in an ideal world, I can avoid surgery, but if that's what I've got to do to, to make sure it's right and it doesn't become a reoccurring problem, then obviously I'll have to just bite the bullet and uh, and get it done. Thankfully, you know the thumb is on the the same hand as the as the bicep and the shoulder, so at least it can all sort of get done at one time. You know, I won't want to be walking around in a in a sling on one arm and a cast on the other. You know, right. so it, it's one of the areas we just gotta. I've just gotta wait for the doctors get this scan done. And go from there, you know. It's um, it's not ideal because obviously I would have liked to uh, to fight again before the end of the year. I feel like I'm in a good spot now to to push towards those rankings, but it's just a small bump in the road. So, how big of a deal is this situation for you in in Wales right now? Undefeated in the UFC. I know it's not the biggest uh, country in the world. I think I looked it up. Three million people. Um, I know, I know they've backed you. Even when you were in Cage Warriors, they used to have big crowds, bigger than Connor ever got when he was Cage Warriors champion in Ireland. But right now, with a win like this, to continue 
your undefeated streak, not only in the UFC, but in your entire career. Um, are you starting to feel a lot of support, a lot of buzz, a lot of hype surrounding you? Yeah, uh, the the support in Wales, like you said, has always been mad. But the last sort of the last week or so, building up to the fight and and after the fight, it, it's been unbelievable. Um, you know, B BBC Wales stuff like that, all, all, all the big news outlets over here now uh, uh, want to jump on the bandwagon. Um, but the support back here has always been awesome. From from like you said, I I had, had a big big following back in Cage Warriors. And I fought in front of five thousand, I think it was in the, in the Ice Arena in Wales. And it's just getting, it seems to be getting bigger and bigger. And, you know, it'd be, it'd be great to, uh, to, to, to bring it back to Wales one day and, and sort of have the fans. That's why I was looking forward to London so much, you know, because it's not, it's not, it's a, it's as close to an home show for me as I'm going to get. It's only three hours up the road. It'd have been a good couple of thousand Welsh that would have been keen to go and, uh, and make this South Yard if it was, if it was in London. But the, the support is unbelievable. Obviously, I can't, can't thank everyone, especially my little town of Avatar It feels like, uh, it feels like the entire town was uh, was out supporting me Saturday night and, and and watching me. The amount of videos and pictures I got sent of of, of people meeting up in the pubs and, uh, and and the local clubs to to watch me fight was awesome. It was unbelievable. I'm a I'm a glass half empty kind of guy. I'm a lamenter. I'm the kind of guy who's like, uh, oh, look at their lawn is nicer than my lawn. I, I I can't get over the fact that this fight should have been in London. And then I see Leeds. Um, you know, and, and the crowd that they had on, on Saturday with Katie Taylor and, 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 and Ben and Warrington, I was like, man, you guys deserve that. And f so for you, you know, obviously it didn't end well with, with Darren, but you know, Patty and you and Molly and Tom, like you would have, you would have come across as superheroes on television with those crap, with that crowd, with those people going nuts at the O2 or wherever it was, pick a place, any city in, in, in England, wherever it was. Is it, was that a bummer for you? Like, obviously, you're not focusing on that on fight night. But when you look back, you're like, man, this shouldn't have been at the empty apex or 100 people there. This should have been at a sold out arena somewhere in England. Yeah, looking back, like, think how much bigger it would have been uh, had it been in the O2 or, or Wembley Arena or, or, or you know, even in um, in the Echo in Liverpool, something yeah. like that. Especially with yeah. Darren and, and Paddy and Molly. I think, like you said, wherever it would have been, if if we could have just had 10,000 or 15,000, the the atmosphere would have been. Incredible, especially for, for us British guys. I mean, it is a tough pill to swallow, obviously. I've had four fights in the UFC now, and, and three of them have been nigh on in, in empty arenas between the Apex and, and Fight Island. So that that was my... I was hoping that would be my coming out party, you know, taking all the Welsh there, having that big support in the arena, the big atmosphere, the big buzz. Um, but obviously, we weren't meant to be this time. So, I mean, what can you do? It's like... Yeah. When when you see these crowds for the boxing, I mean, Anthony Joshua's fighting now in yeah. what is it two weeks? He's yeah. going to have a mental crowd. It's like how much more, how much more, how much longer have we got to wait before we can start enjoying and experiencing that ourselves. So I know we got some of the crowds back in um, in MSG and, and and obviously for the McGregor fight and stuff like that. But it it would be nice for us uh, us guys to to get back to fighting in front of our local fans as well as obviously you know the the guys at the Apex. So you're a youngster. You're you're around how old? Six, seven? When you start practicing martial arts because of Six. your dad? Six. And it was your father, Richard, who got you into this, right? Yeah. So believe it or not, I actually started uh, training before my dad. Um, really? He took me. To, yeah. So he took me to to a local kickboxing gym. Obviously, at that age, it was just just getting me out the house. I spent trying to bring a bit of energy, stop me running right in the house, and. Um, he noticed when he got to the gym that they also did um, adults classes in, in Japanese jiu-jitsu and a little bit of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So within like two or three weeks, he had joined the club himself. Um, Joe Duffy w was training at the club. I think Joe was about 14 or 15. And he just fell in love with it, you know, done a little bit of judo and stuff like that as a youngster, my father, but never never anything serious. And, and he said, you know, he went from training once a week to within four weeks, he was there five, six nights a week and um, eventually went on there to open his own gym when I was about 12 years of age and, and it's, it's taken off from me, to be honest. I've been with him as my head coach training under him and, and, and the coaches at our gym ever since. Wow. Uh, what was he doing before all of that? Because obviously this became his life's work, right? What was he doing before that? Just playing football, working in a factory and, and playing football. That, 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 that was his, uh, that was all he, obviously he, used, he, he run, um, he run pubs and clubs and stuff in, uh, in our local town. So, he did a bit of judo and a bit of traditional jiu-jitsu stuff with, with some of the local doormen. But, you know, it was no real, he'll tell you himself, it was no real sort of 
instructor and student type of role. It was you just rocked up and, and practiced a couple of the moves you've seen on 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 the UFC on the VHS, and that that was it. But um, that was his first taste, obviously, of true martial arts. You know, like you said, he he's gone from being a guy who would like the thought he could handle himself, you know, working the doors and stuff like that, to going into a gym and you've got 14, 15 year old kids choking him out five times in, in five minutes. And, uh, he, he said, he always said it, you know, he'll, he'll leave a crush you and you, you'll avoid going back or it, or it intrigues you and makes you want to think, you know, what, what's going on here? How am I, how am I getting beaten up by kids? And, uh, and that's where I was. He, he just fell in love with it. And, uh, obviously then, uh, transpired and passed down to myself and you know it was his life he was out he was out in the gym five nights a week and, and I was there with him from such a young age at, at what age do you start to think to yourself like this is actually something I want to do for a living that I'm going to be a pro fighter and make money off of this I think it was probably when so when he opened his own gym in 2007 I would have been about 12 or 13 and um he, he had a good amateur team uh, a couple of them on the verge of going pro and there was no kids class at the time. Obviously, MMA in Wales was was not really heard of. You had your, your jiu-jitsu and your kickboxing and your taekwondo, but we were the only real MMA gym about. And um, seeing these older boys who who in the town where I'm from, you know, had this reputation of being the tough guys and uh, and the street fighters, seeing them fight in a cage and turning professional and getting paid, although it wasn't a, a big amount, you know, they were getting paid. I thought, you know, I'm training with these guys every night of the week. This, I, I'd love to have a goal there and. I started fighting amateur and, and doing my jiu-jitsu comps. And it was when I started to succeed as an amateur, I think it, it clicked a little bit, you know, it was like, maybe, maybe I could, uh, maybe I could make a career out of this one, you know, turn pro and, and see where it goes. I mean, <clears throat> when I won the IMAF tournament, that was probably when it sort of set in stone in my head that, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go down any other route here. I'm just gonna ride, ride this till the wheels fall off. If I make it, I make it. And if I don't, I don't. And, but, you know, thankfully, uh, I put myself in a position where I now do it as a, for a living and do it full time. Yeah, and you're very good at it. You're undefeated, like I said, 15-0, <laughs> uh, just coming off uh, a great win this past Saturday against Ludwig Shalinian. You're just 26. You're a fit guy. Uh, you know, you got the, the buzz cut. You're, 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 you're clean. You're 135. You're, you know, you're in shape. Um, and so that leads me to uh, to wonder, Jack, uh, I have somehow uh, stumbled upon a photo of you from about 10 or so years ago, Jack. Here um, we go. And uh, Yoon, if you don't mind uh, putting this photo up, uh, that's for the public. This is for you, Jack, right over here. I don't know if you can oh, see that one. No. Um, I, you know, that's it was, the prom photo. That's yes, the prom photo. This is the prom photo, <laughs> uh, Jack, and uh, it, it's a lovely hair uh, cut that you've got a lovely suit um and i'm just wondering you know who this guy Ron is Stewart. yes what is going on here jack what is this look that we're rocking here because this look uh, let's get let's get the photo back up there just for a second in case someone missed it. yes there it is uh how do we go from that uh, guy to this guy killing people in the ufc 15 and 0 tell us the backstory behind this photo jack so like take away the a cut but as a kid <laughs> I, I was done I, I just had um i didn't like as a kid i I was always fit and, and always in the gym, but I just never had great genetics. You know, probably wasn't the best with my diet at, at our age. I was a little chubby kid, to be honest, area up until about 17, 18. And um, it was only when I started training at an amateur boxing gym where they were like, you know, you need to get running and, and shift a bit of weight that uh, that I started <laughs> to lean out a little bit. But everyone always rips me for that cut. But if I pull up my if I pull up my school photo right from that year, there's about ten of us with, with the same with the same cut with the highlights and the fringe and and then and the full head of it. But um, my my friends will be very happy you've pulled that one up and, and done me dirty with it. So uh, listen, I'm not. You know. a, someone sent it to me. I'm I'm not scouring your <laughs> Facebook. I won't say who it was, but they said uh, be sure to ask Jack about this photo. And if I'm being honest, I was mesmerized by the photo and I had to ask because <laughs> I mean the glow up as they say is real. I don't know if you guys use that term over there in Wales, but you have glowed up, my friend. I mean. That's a good look for back in the day. Rod Stewart's a legend. I mean, why not? Why not represent him? But I think this look for your career. By the way, if you would have, if you fight with that look, you'd be very. I mean, look what the hair is doing for Patty right now. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I, I, someone needs to tell Patty. I had the, I had the original blonde, blonde, blonde long hair, not, uh, not the baddie. But uh, he rocks it a lot better now than than why probably would if I was to uh, to grow it back. So this is a thing. A lot of people give you crap for that picture. Oh, constantly. So I've got a. Uh, I've got my my friend Colin. He's he literally every time I have a fight or his fight, he changes his profile pictures <laughs> on all sorts of to that exact picture that you just showed. So it surfaces like multiple times a year. Then 
then the memories start coming up on Facebook from my prom and my mother will share it or my father will share it to, uh, to, to get a little giggle out of it. And then next thing I know, you've got it live on you. Like, on uh, the... I'm sorry. <laughs> so it is what it is. It's, it's, yeah. I think I'll take that one to the grave. Maybe I'll bring it back one day. Perhaps when I retire, I'll bring the, uh, I'll bring the do back. When you're inducted into the UFC Hall of Fame, you, you uh, dust off that suit, that, that tux. And that I'll, I'll rock up to collect the, the trophy with, with, with a big wig of it. Yes. Um, by the way, one other question about your father. You know, we don't see this a lot in MMA. You see it a lot in boxing. You know, father-son duos, fathers training their son. You don't see it as much in MMA for whatever reason. Uh, and I can imagine it's great at times, but also it's your dad. You know, that's, that's a different kind of relationship. Has it ever been t – I mean, it's going great. You're 15 to no, but to the point where you're like, huh, maybe – you know, I need some separation. Has it ever been difficult, given the fact that it's your father who's there in your corner as your head coach? To be honest, um, we've got a good sort of dynamic in terms of when we're in the gym, we're, we're fighter and coach. When we're out in the gym, we're father and son. You know, we try to, we try to like, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want fighting. I don't want my life for my father to be fighting 24-7, you know. So when I'm out in the gym, we, we don't go into depth too much, you know. Obviously, when we got fights coming up and stuff like that, there's, there's outside the gym stuff we got to do in terms of like looking at the opponent and game planning. But um, if I'm honest, because it's all I've ever known, you know, it's never really... A lot of people say to me, what's it like to, to have your dad in the corner? But he's been in my corner for every boxing match, jiu-jitsu match, amateur fight, pro fight I've ever had. So to me, it's the norm, you know. It's, it's like... Um, I don't know, it, it, it's sort of like your average fighter having their head coach in the corner then. You know, it's like John Jones having Greg Jackson in the corner. It, it doesn't feel strange to him because that's what he's used to. And it's been the same with me. You know, he's always worked and, and we have got that dynamic, right? When I'm in the gym, you know, I don't get no special treatment. If anything, I probably, I, I like to think I got worse than, uh, than some of the other boys. He's, he's harsher on me, I, I, in my opinion, than, than some of the other guys' opinion, than, than some of the other guys at the gym. But when we are out of the gym, you know, it's, there's not too much talk of fighting and, and, and and sort of, you know, it's like we're, we're drilling technique in the house 24-7. Right, you know, right, right. We, okay. we, when we're in the gym, we're working. When we're out of the gym, we, we just enjoy normal life. And I think that's why uh, why it works so well. That is good. That is healthy. Um, so we're awaiting word on recovery time, whether surgery will be needed and whatnot. I, I, I saw you throw out some names. Um, you threw out Cody Stamen. Uh, who else did you throw out? I think Marlon Moraes as well. Did you throw his name out? Or uh, so what, what's his name? Song? Song, Song Yadong, yeah. Um, yeah. A Sun So, I'd, I'd love, love to fight guys like that as well. Just uh, th those three guys, mainly because of, because of their position in the rankings. I'm not, I'm not like, I, I'm a realist. You know, they're not going to chuck me in with a top five guy or, or a top ten guy. I, I just need to get, get that opportunity again. Those guys who's on the bottom end of the ranks in terms of, of their number, that, that's going to put me in the mix. And, and I think a fight with any of those three stylistically would be a fun one to watch. And, you know, especially after Saturday, I feel like I'm ready for that step up in competition now. You know, especially someone like uh, Sun Tso, who's been there, seen it, done it with all the top names. You know, I think he's 40 fights plus on, on, on his pro record, been in the UFC for God knows how long. So someone like that, I think, is, is the, the necessary test I know that I need now to, to prove to people that, you know, I, I'm... I can school these guys who, who, who are lower down, but I can also compete and beat these guys who are the elite of the elite as well. And that, that, that's where I want next. You know, that's what I'm going to be pushing hard for. Long way to go. You're still very young. But when do you think you become the first Welshman to fight for a UFC title in your mind? I like to think within the next three, four years in an ideal world, you know, I'm not, like you said, I'm 26. I'm not, I'm not you. I'm not rushing things. I don't want to just be fast tracked up the ladder. I want to win my spot, win my stripes. And, you know, I want when that opportunity comes for people to look back and there'd be no, no argument that I deserve to be there and I deserve to fight for the title. So, like I said, if I can get out of ranking now, it's just a matter of, of climbing and, and fighting those top level guys. You know, they, it's, they're a different kettle of fish to the, to the guys I've been fighting at the minute. They, you've got to prepare for them mentally and physically in a different way. You know, they, they are the elite of the elite and, and that's what I'm ready for. That's why I got into the sport to do, even as an amateur, I envision fighting those guys. So, Three, four years, Ariel, you know, providing all goes well. And no doubt there'll be a few bumps in the road, but I like to think I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be the guy to, uh, to challenge for the title first, especially, you know, from Wales. I like to think I'm leading the charge for us at the minute. Absolutely. You are certainly that guy. Uh, great to meet you for the first time, Jack. Sorry it took me so long to have you. You know, it was <laughs> tough uh, in my previous life to, to have uh, the guests that I wanted on. But it's a new day. 
It's a new chapter for you and I. I, I hope you have a very uh, speedy recovery. Hopefully no surgery. You can avoid that, and we'll see you back in there maybe the early portion of uh, 2022. My best, your father as well. I don't want to feel his wrath ever again, <laughs> and I'm really looking forward to seeing what you're doing. And and I hope one day that we get to see you fight for a UFC title and you can you know give all the fans who have been supporting you for so long and having your back because you really have a very loyal fan base. I love it. You know you you can uh, prove them right that that you are worth following and supporting. So all the best to you, my friend, and thanks for coming on. No problem, Ariel. Thank you. First of many, I'm sure. So absolutely. Absolutely. I look forward to the next time. There he is, Jack Shore, kind enough to join us. Uh, you should remember that name. Jack Tank Shore, 26 years young. I was supposed to do a pause there. You know, Frank, mysterious Frank in the back. He was telling me, Ariel, you're speaking too fast. I get excited, okay? You got these top-level fighters, these top-level athletes. They come on with these loyal fan bases. They give us some time. I get excited, and I speak very quickly, and I want to say a lot, and I want to pump them up, and I want to be thankful. I want to be grateful for their time. They came on my show on a Wednesday. They could be doing anything on a beautiful, I'm assuming beautiful, early September Wednesday evening in Wales. But he chose to come on my show, and I'm very thankful. Okay, there's my little break. Uh, 26 years young, former Cage Warriors champ, Jack Shore. Remember that name? 3-4-0 uh, in the UFC. And I think a name that will be a part of that bantamweight division for quite some time. Uh, in a matter of seconds, we've got a very, uh, a very fun Cage Warriors alumni feel. And this is for all those people who who were saying that I was hating on the Cage Warriors scene. Hating? I mean, I'm the lone freaking North American journalist covering this sport who continues to give not only the European fighters, not only the English fighters, not only the Irish fighters, not only the Welsh fighters, the Cage Warriors fighters, some love. You don't find any hate in here. There's no hate in this heart. And I have to be honest, Patty winning was fantastic. It, it warmed my heart. It truly did. It was a, a great moment. We've been talking about him for so long. And to finally see him in there, fighting in the UFC, getting that W, uh, you know, overcoming some adversity, that was tremendous. Jack continuing his winning ways, that was tremendous. Tom Aspinall continuing his winning ways, that was tremendous. You know, bummer for Darren Till. You got to give Derek Brunson his props. He is looking good. He is on a roll. He deserves a big fight. He should be fighting Jared Cannonier or the winner of Izzy Whitaker, but I think fight Cannonier as a number one contender fight, and then let's see if you get that title fight. He certainly has warranted uh, a spot in that discussion, in that title picture, so I was happy for him. But I don't know if any result warmed my heart quite like seeing Meatball Molly McCann defeat Jay Yun Kim. What a performance. What a gritty win. What a hard-fought win. I mean, all the characteristics, all the traits that we love so much about Molly McCann, one of my favorite people in the game, and I was just so happy to see her happy victorious. And then that moment, I mean, is there a more wholesome duo right now in the sport of mixed martial arts than Molly McCann and Patty Pimblett? I don't know if there is one. I can't think of one more wholesome than those two. It's a beautiful thing. Later on, we'll talk to Patty, but for now, let's go back to the Zoom machine and say hello to the incomparable meatball Molly McCann. There she is. Molly, how are you? What's happening, mate? How are we? Oh, uh, Molly, it's so good to see you smiling, happy, in the winner's circle. I could give you a big old hug right now, Molly, if I could. Virtual. Come in, Come in, yeah. Virtual. How are you feeling? Yeah. Um, I have, I've slept for about the last 20 hours, to be honest. My, um, the emotion and the travel and then the alcohol all mixed in. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's, um, I'm a little bit tired and I can feel the effects now, Ariel, like my jaw, my head, my hands. That was, um, it was a tough fight, wasn't it? But uh, I think we all knew I had that one in the bag. Any, any serious injuries? This hand's definitely broke on the thumb, um, but I need an MRI just to see how long, um, the recovery time is going to be on the course of recovery, but I can't go until Monday next week. So Okay. Why so long? I have to isolate. Oh, really? Okay. Because I'm, we're in the I'm States. Not double, I'm not double jabbed. So 
<laughs> I understand, Molly. I understand. Um, well, it was, I mean, there was a lot on the line. There was a lot at stake. I, I wonder if for you, I mean, you have fought before. You have fought on some big stages. You've had some important fights. Did you feel more nervous going into this one? Did you feel like the pressure was on? No. How come? I just feel like there was, there was a, the only way was up. It, I couldn't go any lower than where I've been. And I knew there was going to be a crowd. And albeit it, there was like 100 or 150 people in there. That's all I need to fight. And um, yeah, they, I knew my career, like it did kind of ride on that fight within the UFC. I know like there's other promotions they'll have me or even boxing, I'll go over to match room after I finish the MMA. But I just, I know what I'm capable of. And when it, when a, a crowd's there, it's very rare that I'm in a, a boring fight. And um, Someone works for Everton, they called him now, right, Ariel. And he's actually the guy who sent you the shade he, he had to, and the mug. And he actually gave me this. Oh, that is a beautiful one that you have there. Here's Chael Sonnen. Yes. yes. Big ups, Everton. Let's go. Yeah. Blue till I die. But, yeah, but basically, he said to me, don't fear fighting, Molly, because it's what you love to do. You can make loads of money presenting after fighting. So just go in there and enjoy yourself. And I thought... I always put so much pressure on myself to be the same fighter or fight a certain way. And then I just went and done me and I, I was just a gritty fighter in the pocket and, um, and got back to what makes me great. Uh, you also got headbutted early in the fight. <laughs> How much did that mess yeah. you up? Well, you can hear it in the, in the commentary in a, when I come back after round one. Ellis and Paul are speaking to me and they're like, yeah, you got hit with a headbutt there. And then it's like 30 seconds and I go, was it a headbutt? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it, <laughs> it was pure um, fight or flight that got me through the first round. But um, after that, I kind of got a little bit, I was warm. I was quite cold going into the first round and then into the second, I was ready. And it was just about getting past them that 10 inch reach, which I think I've done quite well with, to be honest. Did you think you won at the end? You know, sometimes with these judges. Yeah. Yeah. hundred yeah, percent. Like I half thought I won the first rounds as well. Um, it was just like um, Bisbon said, or Daniel Cormier said, it's just how the, the judges thought the headbutt was a knockdown. But I still landed more significant shots than here. I was more aggressive. I didn't take a backward step. She was always on the back foot. And I landed the more concussive shot. So for me, it was me all day. So it's been a while, unfortunately, Molly, and I apologize. It's been a while since we last spoke. Um, and well, so it's my fault for not winning, isn't it? <laughs> no, I don't care about that. I'm not one of these, you know, oh, I'm not one of these, what have you done for me lately types. You know, I, I like talking to certain people and you're one of them, but you know, a different time. We don't need to go there. Um, I haven't talked to you since the last fight. And so what, what was going on? Like, cause I know you, you took off the gloves and then literally a few minutes later, you're like, no, 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 I'm not retiring. Explain like, were, was there a part of you that thought? I, yeah. I was frustrated and I thought, right, just leave them there for your dad. And if you've retired, you've left your gloves there. So you've done it. And then when I was in the changing rooms, the comms team came and asked my coach, Paul, and she was like, he was like, no, she's not retired. And, I had like a two hour conversation with my coaches after the fight because I was like, I can't give any more than I'm given. And when someone, I come to fight, fight, and like, and I felt like that person I fought, Lara, just came just to hold on and not even try and finish me, like literally just pin me to the wall or the floor. And it's like, if you're going to beat me, please try and submit me or finish me and put me away don't just stall and I had never come up against that kind of fight really before so in boxing it's like a stalemate like mm -hmm. or a bit of a journeyman and I feel like that's what she was and I wasn't I was not prepared for that because people don't fight like that in MMA so I just felt like I'd been given a rough go at it in terms of like drug cheats and then just like just shit matchups, and I never, I would never turn a fight down. So stylistically, I know sometimes that 
I will face styles that don't really suit mine. But it was just annoying that it was back to back. And then um, my coach just kind of used Mike Bisbin as an example and said, do you think he's never sat down like this and felt like how you're feeling? And I said, I suppose so, yeah. He said, well, carry on and crack on like he did. And after the fight aerial, I just went away to Spain and trained with a guy called Chris Tom Thompson and his wife Louise and just just got back to just... I'd done about 96 rounds of rolling and then I came home. I won a, I won a grappling competition in Spain and thought, I can go home now, I'm ready to go again. And sometimes you just need them little resets. Absolutely. Uh, we all need that in life. At any point, though, did you think the idea of maybe taking a break was something... Like, Did you have any part of you that was kind of relishing the idea of doing something completely different or you knew that you would always be... This is, this is who you are, right? This is what you're bred to do. I mean... Um, I come from boxing and post MMA, I'll go back to boxing. But like, I've, I'm given my whole life to MMA for as long as I can do it. And as long as I'm competitive and I'm winning and I'm winning well, I'm always going to be within within the UFC. Like, if I wasn't in the UFC, I wouldn't, I can't really see myself doing MMA anymore because I don't want to do something to not be the best at what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But when you go away from the limelight and out of Liverpool, like me, Paddy and Darren are very well known here, so you can't kind of go anywhere without everyone knowing you. So I just went to Spain and just no one knew me and I could just enjoy the training. And then I came back and I had a, I got a new mind coach, Tom Smith, and he just made me believe, like, why, did you, why have you lost your way and your vision and your goals and your dreams? Because you're settling and you need to be keep on pushing and reaching uh, to be the best. So I just had to have a few long words with myself and then I feel like I'm back. You, you do feel like you're back. You seem like you're back. It looks like you're back. Uh, my coach, that's very interesting to me. Did you have one before this new one or is this the first time you've worked with one? Um. Every now and then I used to speak to Vinny Shawman. If I'm not sure if you know who he who he is, but he's kind of like a mind coach and he's in the Thai boxing game. But um Tom Smith is from Belfast and he kind of approached me after the fight, just like kid, I want to help you out here. So he reached out to you he first. To, he reached out to me. Wow. Yeah. And he um he basically came on as a financial sponsor because he was like, Well, so I know you didn't get paid too much for the last fight, so let me help you out. And um, and I want to be a mind coach. So he'd ring me up every morning and just just go through it with me every day. There's not not many days here that I don't speak to him. Every day? I, yeah. For how long? Since like February 10th. How long is each call? Oh, it could be anything from three minutes to half an hour. Wow. So like, hey, yeah. how are you doing? You talk. That, that's a lot every day, no? You enjoy it? Yeah, yeah. Well, he's like a. I call him like my uncle, like uh -huh. Uncle Tom now. <laughs> uncle Tom. Yeah, <laughs> it's quite yeah. bad. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, now we just he I I ring him to speak to him how he is also. But he um, he's changed my life, Ariel. He's really changed my life. He, dream mentoring. If anyone wants to know, Tom Smith, the entrepreneur on Instagram. Get at him. Uh -huh. Wow. Uh, do you think that you have a result like this without him? Did he? Was he a part of this result? Is he a part of this new year? So he hasn't given me anything new other than made me remember who I was. So. But that's valuable. It is me, he, it is me who won the fight. It's, it's Molly from Cage Warriors. It's Molly from the UFC debut, uh, UFC London fight with one big eye. He just made me remember who I am and he reinforces that and reinstills that in me every day. So I'd like to say I still would have won, um, but I also probably might not have because the mind, I think, was injured from the last two losses and he helped me heal the mind. Last win, October 18th, 2019. That's a, that's, that's a long stretch. That's the longest, like from playing soccer or football for the English, from boxing, being national champion from 
any MMA fight, any jiu-jitsu competition. I've never lost two consecutive things in my life. Wow. And to go like 23 months with that was rough. And I've got a, a lot of people in my life and I was like, uh, who've come in recent years. And I, like, you don't even know me as a winner. So that was like, it was so tough. But even though I wasn't winning in the cage, I, I'm winning outside of life. Like the stuff I'm doing for my community and my gym, for myself, for my personal growth, I'm winning. And as a mixed martial artist, I'm winning because I'm turning up every day and I'm getting better. But it was nice to get the seal of approval, like the 50 grand bonus, the win, to be bumping heads with the, the best in the business, to be doing it all with Paddy, and then hopefully I'll get a nice new contract in the next week or two. So it was the longest two years, but I feel like it's led me to this point. Beautiful uh, video that surfaced of you reacting to getting the, uh, the 50K bonus. Obviously, we see how happy you are and emotional, um, but what, what is that happiness and, and emotion represent? Where does it come from? Why did you react like that? I just come from nothing. Um, so to win any, for any kinds of money is just like next level. But I think for me, it was the recognition of my hard work. It wasn't even so much the money, but like I feel as if I could have been in a few fights of the nights before this one. And I was kind of picked like pipped off by the the more well-known fighters on the card. So for it all to come full circle, and like I even had my manager, Graham Boylan, in the corner for this fight because one of my coaches, Simon, couldn't travel last minute. So it was um, it was it was just mad. It was like it was all meant to be aerial, but that money will be a deposit for a house. Like I'll finally be able to do that. Do you know what I mean? And the... I always said all I wanted from fight was a world title and to, to have a house bought and I will have like had a career that like I don't know, if you can say that you've got a, a fully paid house and your mortgage is finished, then you've done quite well, haven't you? So to, to kind of fall into MMA by accident and then to have this amazing career, it's oh it's just mad. It is mad. Um, and, and everyone loves how real you are and, uh, you know, you're, you're just, what you see is what you get. You're a very easy person to root for. And like I said earlier, uh, your relationship with Patty is one of the best things in MMA and to see you both on the same card, you know, almost back to back and to see your happiness. You don't see that from a lot of people being genuinely happy for their friends, for their teammates. There's bitterness and jealousy and stuff like that. And it was just so wholesome. It was so great to see. Can you describe what that was like to see this kid who you have been around for so long, who ups and downs, right? Who had turned down the UFC contract, who people were saying was going to be a never was just a cage warrior champ. And then he wins a fight like that. It was amazing that they had the camera on you, but can you describe what that was like for you to see? Yeah, I was like, I was literally talking to Megan Olivia in the, in the back room. And I'm like, I'm trying to open my gin and then I'm trying to take the microphone and I'm waiting and then they wouldn't let me out to watch him. And we could see him in the, in the monitor and it, it kind of wasn't going great. Yes. <laughs> um, so like it wasn't going great. And then I just ran out and I started screaming for him. I'm not sure if you can even hear it. And then he ends up, he ends up doing the business and it's like, I've seen him on his dark days like I knew him before he'd had amateur fights and then I seen the rise and I seen the, the fall and um and that week was like we kept having like little moments like I'd come into his room and we'd just sit there together watching Game of Thrones and just being really close and we've never really had that time together really because we're always surrounded by other people and I just feel like we just connected on a really good level and then um, to see him come through that adversity and then get the finish, I just I don't know why someone wouldn't want like want that for their teammates or like we like that for everyone in our gym. It doesn't matter who wins if it's an amateur or if it's the captain of our ship, as I always say, Paddy is like we all want that in our gym. But oh, I was so buzzing. You just see me slapping the table for him like that, oh, yes, and then me jumping on Paul Rimmer and then the whole team because it's just, 
imagine the pressure that kid has on his shoulders and he's just wiping it off. Yeah. Like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. How do you like now? <laughs> <laughs> what a character. And now he's got like, I just looked, fi- last I checked, 500. Oh, yeah, what the hell? And he was so sad about his Instagram page getting shut down. <laughs> it's amazing. Well, listen, he'll still, he'll still be going, I would have had 700,000. Right. <laughs> that's the month, but he's the fo- honest to God, every long fight week, when every UFC I'd normally go to, I'm like a fan. I just still look around and go, I can't believe him here. And he was just like so nonchalant, like, yeah, well, I'm supposed to be here, aren't I? And... I really took a lot of um, confidence off him that week. I said to Paul, I said, I just think I should. we should always fight on the same cards because I have said me and him bring something different when we fight together. It's like I'm the, the female him. 100%. That's like it just is. And the, the UFC will miss a trick if they, don't, um, if they don't have us both on the go. Wait, is that, is that why you dyed your hair blonde? To be Blondes the, have more fun. <laughs> to be the female Patty? That's why. Now I get it. Listen, I've been pa- practicing flying triangles, but I told me LCL and my knee, so I couldn't I couldn't really kick, shoot, or do any triangles. So I just had to keep it strictly boxing for the fight, which was a shame. But we got we got the win. Yes. Um and just a couple more things that I want to ask you about. Um great to have you on. Great to talk to you. So happy for your victory. Uh, you you were talking about doing great things in your community. You wrote a book recently, and I want to give you props for that, a beautiful thing. What inspired you to write the book? And for those that may not know about it, what is it about? Um, it's a children's illustrated book, and it's called Be True to You. So it's about my coming out story and how I wasn't able to come out until later in life. And, um, and it's basically a little bit of education all about the LGBTQ plus flag. And then right at the back of the book, it, there's space for a child to tell their story or a young person to tell their story to the parents if they're struggling um, to have the same conversation. But speaking to Tom Smith, my mind coach, um, he wrote a book and he was saying all things like, tell me about your goals, this, that and the other. And then I just thought, I don't know why I don't help my community a little bit more and shine more of a light on how hard it was for me but the MMA community and and MMA is the thing that made me feel safe enough loved enough and safe enough to to have that space to come out really and um, yeah it's done really well to be fair and I don't see the profits I give the profits to Stonewall um, charity which is obviously based in America and um I just what is I know that charity? What Sorry to interrupt. What is Stone, that? Stonewall. What do they what do so, they do? In the sixties, um, there was a gay bar called Stonewall in New York, and it's where the riot started. And then from that moment, the year later to that day, they had the first gay prize march. Wow. And um so they do this thing, Ariel, where they have uh, rainbow laces and once a year. Uh, sorry, for one month of the year in American football, uh, sorry, in English football, they wear the rainbow laces to raise awareness. And I'm not sure if you've seen in the Euros final, uh, Harry Kane had the Stonewall ra- rainbow armbands on. So they're just trying to break down stigma and things and help, just help the gay community and things come out. And I became an ambassador for them, a game changer about two months ago. And I said, well, I'll make it my mission so that someone in the combat sporting world will come out and hopefully that'll be a bit of a, a snowball effect where it, it only takes one person and then everyone else will start to feel a little bit more comfortable in, in breaking that down because when you add it up, it's a numbers game and if you imagine how many people do MMA, you can't tell me that there's not one, one gay male who's doing it, but obviously they just don't feel safe enough to do it. And my thing is, why not? And people kind of just say probably because of the trolls and the abuse and things that they get. And I'm, I'm like, well, you're only going to get as much abuse as what I get. So you, you may get, as well. You get just... a lot of abuse? Yeah. What do you mean? Yeah. Who's abusing you? Well, you just get trolls online every now and then, don't they? I'll kick their ass, Molly. I'll fly over there right now and beat every single one of them with my own bare hands. <laughs> 
aerial it's water off a duck's back but okay. thank you i do appreciate it i mean but, not like you need my help to be honest you could kick my hater's ass <laughs> i know look at this top this is um this this is an everton top for I love LGBT. It. wow that's amazing is that new yeah that's amazing i love James that the sports that would send look, you one. That would look. I was just gonna say that would look nice in this little studio here. If I'm being honest, I'll get you one sent out, lad. Don't worry. I get a lot it's of abuse. Our, our teams doing bits to change yes. the community. I like that. that, and that is one of the many reasons why I'm an Everton fan. To my <laughs> guy, uh, they try to they try to get me to jump off Liverpool. You know, man, you all this nonsense. I will never do that, Molly. Just for you. Um, and and it's good that you're staying ground. I I, I hope yes, absolutely. I hope you keep. Patty's head down. You know, it seems like, you know, a lot of people, like, are we going to have a problem on our hands here? Is the ego going to well, go crazy? What um, I said to him, I said, oh, oh. sorry. No problem. Someone was ringing me. Um, I said to him, you can't go like what you was the first time when you won the world title. But look, he, he's got a house. He's got his fiance. He's got his dog. She, our Laura won't be letting him get above his station. Don't you worry about that. Okay. Uh, yeah. We just want him to bring the UFC back to Liverpool. So that's the the goal. And then I'm telling you, they'll probably get that world title shot one day at Anfield. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That would be nuts. Um. So for you, last thing, what, what do you want to do next? Do you want to try to fight again this year? Probably a long shot with the hand. What's your plan? Well, Ariel, I was told um, it was going to take – four months for me I to heal last time and two weeks later it was I was fixed. I, I healed quick. I would like to fight um this year, but I just want fans still. And I love the apex and all, but I would like a lot of fans. Yeah, of course. So um I was speaking to Dean Thomas and Gillian Robertson. I'm gonna go over to America for a month or five weeks and do a bit of training out there. Um and hopefully get a fight before Christmas so I can enjoy Christmas. I've I've not been able to enjoy Christmas for five years. Because you always had a fight surrounding it? Yeah, I had a fight in January or February, so I'd like to... I want to go to Jamaica for Christmas. <laughs> Great place. Why Jamaica? Yeah, so Any particular reason? I was supposed to go for my 30th and then lockdown cancelled it, ah. so... Yeah, I'll go again. Well, it's uh, it's a new day. It's a new era. The tide is turning. Hopefully, better days are ahead. And uh, it was great to see you back in the winner's circle for the first time in uh, almost two years. Three months, yes. and I won't ever forget it. But, Ariel, thanks for having me on, lads. And I'll make sure that Everton sent, oh, uh-huh. Everton sent you off a little T-shirt. No problem. Always great to talk but to I'm you. Are you a medium or a large? Are you kidding me, Molly? A medium? Do I look like a medium? Extra large, Molly. Have you seen these guns? Extra large. You think, you think this could fit in a medium? I mean, come on. Look at this frame. That would be nice. <laughs> Thank you. No, uh, extra large. One day I'll get back to medium, but not right now. Molly, all the best. Um, congratulations. Enjoy the victory. Enjoy everything that comes with the victory, right? That you could revel in it, digest it. You could shower in the victory. That's something you haven't been able to do. Shower in the 50 Gs, yes. baby. And we'll talk to you very soon. <laughs> Go on, lads. All right. Bye, everyone watching. Bye, bye. There she is, the one and only, the incomparable Molly McCann. I'm gonna move my thing here. You know, I know a lot of you are worried about the way I've been moving, but my neck is killing me lately. I don't know if it's a sign of old age, but my neck has been killing me when I wake up. Is it a bad pillow? Is it a bad mattress? It reminds me of that scene from um, Aladdin. 10,000 years can give you a real crick in the neck, whatever he says, you know. Oh, who's this? My man, Edwards Kim. Giving me a good heads up here. Thank you. Yeah, the YouTube chat, you know. Come on, guys, clean it up. Otherwise, we're just going to. We're just going to shut it down. You know, we actually shut down the YouTube chat back in the day, in the old days. Um, and it's just a bunch of weird, like, what is going on over there? A cesspool of humanity over there. Can you just stop? Oh, Austin says he got a second shot and he's feeling like crap. 
Great to have you, Mayor Hour back. Thank you very much, Austin. Uh, it is great to be here with all of you on this Wednesday. Shana Tova to all the people celebrating the second day of Rosh Hashanah. And uh, we got a lot of big names coming up, of course. Later on, the much-anticipated MMA Hour debut of Ian Gary. A lot of you have been asking me to have Ian Gary on the show for quite some time. 7-0 and as a pro. Former now Cage Warriors welterweight champion, just 20 three years young nickname the future coming off that big win over jack grant back in june and it was just announced earlier today that he'll be fighting jordan williams in his ufc debut ufc 268 november 6th madison square garden new york city turning out to be a great card i mean a little something for everyone i mean just look at these names on this card usman covington Nama Yunus, uh, Zhang Wei Li. It should have been Nama Yunus versus Carlos Barza, if I'm being honest. But, you know, they're great fighters, and it is what it is. Um, I just feel bad for Carla. She deserved that. Uh, Gaethje Chandler, Sean Strickland, Luke Rockhold, Frankie Edgar, Marlon Cheeto Vera. By the way, I watched that Cheeto Vera clip from the show last week maybe a thousand times. That was great stuff. Um, Emin Shabazian. On the card, Jermaine Durandamy, Ally Quinta, uh, TJ Laramie, Shane Burgos, Billy Quillen Quarantillo, uh, Ian Gary against Jordan. I mean, there's just a lot there. A lot there. It's a great card. So uh, we'll talk to Ian Gary about that a little later on in the program. We'll have Patty Pimlet on. Anthony Smith, who's headlining the next UFC card. That's September 18th. They're taking a week off uh, this week, of course. No one wants to go head to head with the uh, the Triller event. Now headlined by Vitor Belfort versus Evander Holyfield. In case you missed it, how weird is that? Um, and also Anderson Silva versus Tito Ortiz. I'm most interested in Anderson, the boxer, continuing down this path. Although again, I wish he was fighting another boxer. And just announced yesterday, Donald Trump Sr. and Jr. going to be a part of the broadcast. So if you were thinking at any point that this promotion was starting to feel like affliction. Here's Donald Trump to return and uh, make it really feel like Affliction. Because, of course, Donald Trump was one of the front men for Affliction when they had their two events way back in the day. So I don't know. Like, imagine if he's going to be breaking down fights. Obviously, it's not going to happen. He'll sit there. You know, he'll he'll just let it ride. And they'll get some buzz off of all of that. For now, though, uh, let us go back to the Zoom machine and say hello to our next guest. I'm really looking forward to talking to this man. He is undefeated in the UFC. He is also another Cage Warriors alum. He is coming off a great first round finish over Sergey Spivak this past Saturday. Defeated Andre Arlovsky as well in the UFC. Four and on the UFC, four finishes. And there he is, the one and only Tom Aspinall, who everyone thinks is going to be the future of the heavyweight division. Big win for him on Saturday. Kind enough to join us for the first time. And Tom, I have to say, it's so great to have you on. Been trying to book you on my many shows for well over a year. You finally made some time for me. You finally came on. Thank you so much for that. Ariel, what is this? Four long fights. Four long fights I've been waiting for this shit. Yeah. And uh, we finally made it. But guess what? I learned something about you recently. You're a Canadian man. Is that true? That You just learned about that recently? I only talk about it every time I'm on the air, Tom. Oh, well, I didn't want to sound like too much of a fan. I've known it for a while. Okay. But that means two things. That means two things to me, Ariel. Yes, the yes. The first thing is I have a lot of family in Canada, so I have a close connection with the Canadian people. Okay. And the second thing, that means you are from the same nation as one of the best people to ever walk on this earth. George St. Pierre? Nope. Bret Hart? Nope. I don't know. Come on, Ariel. Avril Levine. Avril Levine. I love Avril. Come on. He's just a skater boy. I say see you later, boy. He na 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 na. You're a big Avril fan? Oh, come on. Who doesn't love Avril? She's a legend. A 90s legend. She is. One of the all-time best. Wow. I feel like I just learned so much about you, Tom. Uh, by the way, where does your family live in Canada or your 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 friends? Family or friends? Family. Family. A lot of my family live in Canada, actually. Really? My granddad's sister. Yeah, my granddad's sister. 
who is now in her 80s, went to Canada when she was in her 20s. So I've got all kinds of family out there. Now, which part of in. Canada? It's not just a dirt road, Tom. You know, it's a big country. Second largest landmass. I've actually been to Canada. It's uh, Victoria, Vancouver Island. Yes, British Columbia, all the way on the west. Beautiful place, Ariel. I want to move there when I've retired from MMA, I think. Okay. Beautiful place. Uh, just like your beautiful background. I mean, what a background this is, Tom. Where are we right now? This is my uh, this is my bedroom. This is my wife's work. Wow. This is my wife. One, she, it's a wallpaper. It's just a wallpaper, but she put it up. I can't take no credit oh. for it. It's, it's nice, isn't it? <laughs> I, thought, I thought you were implying that your wife painted it or something or drew it. No, but she can three boys. My oldest boy is five, and then I've got twin boys that are two. Wow, and you're only 28. That's right, yeah. I had my first my first kid when I was uh, 20. I think we found out that we were pregnant when um, I was 22, I think. Wow, okay, good for you. you. You think you're done, or you think you'll have a couple more? Oh, I'm done, bro. I'm so yeah. done. I'm so done with this. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I always wanted to – it's not like I want – if I had three girls, I wouldn't be upset. I always wanted a, a girl, but you know when you have twins, it's a completely different experience. I bet. Um, so, you know, like now, if I hear – if I'm – out in and somewhere and I hear a baby crying, I get like goosebumps all through my body. I don't, I can't deal with any more babies crying. Like, oh, I thought you were going to say like, like the good kind of goose, goosebumps, like you miss it. No, I, okay. I don't really like, ba I, babies and me, it's not a great combination. I'm good with the kids, you know, my kids are, my twins are two now, they're at a really good age, like they're amazing, I absolutely love spending time with them, but when they're really small babies, I just don't, I just don't know what to do. It gives me so much anxiety, man, I don't know. Yeah. No, it's tough. It's not for everyone, but you're doing well. 28, three kids on a roll in the UFC. The reason I said that at the beginning of the show for or the interview, for those that don't know, is you gave me crap when I reached out to you to come on and said, oh, it's been four fights and I've been waiting and this and that. So it feels like you were kind of like you had a bit of pent up aggression towards me. You, you were feeling like I was slighting you, like I wasn't giving you the love and attention that you deserve. Is that accurate? Because I can handle that. Well, you seem to have the effect on people, don't you, really? You seem to have the effect that you just naturally instigate shit and piss no, people off. That is, so, not true. Uh, that is not true. Yeah, I guess I I guess I was a little bit pissed off with you. So okay. I still am to be honest. You've got a lot more work to do. So I'm still right. I'm still pretty pissed off. So uh you're pretty lucky that I've come on to be honest. Future heavyweight champion. So uh, I'm gonna be an all time great. So uh yeah. you're pretty lucky. Yeah, uh, you're lucky. It got really awkward when I thought that I was reaching out to Tom Breeze to come on <laughs> and <laughs> Big yeah. shout out to Tom Brees. Yeah. Tom Big Brees. shout out to Tom Brees. Yes, yeah. legend. Good guy. legend. Um, so how are we feeling, Tom, after that big win? Another first round finish, another, I mean, just impeccable performance. No, like, you, you, I would imagine you look at those fights and you're like, oh, maybe I can have a little more time to show off, or do you like these? You want to go in one minute, two minutes, and be done with it? I do. I would be lying if I said that I didn't like these. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm also aware that I need a lot more experience to compete with the top guys. So I, I do want to have longer fights, but I also love short fights with bonuses. Like, I'll take that all day. And I guess, you know, like you say, I'm only 28. Heavyweights usually go to the early 40s. So um, the, the longer fights are going to come, man. Like, if I can take the early, if I can take the quick fights right now, like, I'll take them. I don't need to be in there for any more time than I need to be. So. Uh, I'm sure one day I'm going to look back and think, shit, I would love to have like a quick fight again. Uh, so I'm just enjoying it. I'm just enjoying it for what it is right now. Um, and, and so when you, I just want to take a step back, also reminded me a bit of Jack, uh, who we spoke to earlier on the show. You got into martial arts relatively young as well, right? Well, how old were you? Seven, eight, six? So yeah, something like that. It's difficult to say really when I started because my dad is, um, he's one of the first UK BJJ black belts. Yeah. So I've I've always been around like jujitsu and martial arts, boxing, all the rest of it. Um, so it's really difficult to say when I actually started to do any kind of martial arts. I think I was about seven, six, something like that. And how did he get into it? Because you know, back when your father was practicing jujitsu and 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 becomes a black belt, I would imagine jujitsu wasn't all that popular in England. Yeah, it wasn't. So he had a bit of a crazy start. So he got into it obviously through the through the graces and stuff like that, the same as everybody else, but. In the UK, jiu-jitsu wasn't like easily available like it is right now. So, Hodger Gracie's dad, Maurice, Maurizio Gomez, used to come over like once a year and do seminars. 
And then him and he was, I think he was doing judo at the time or wrestling or something. Him and his friends from, from the gym used to go and go to the seminars. And then they essentially just used to practice the, the techniques with, with one another for, for a year until he came back. That's how it used to work, like back in the day in like 93, 94. So, uh, yeah, that, that's how it started in this country anyway. And so for you, your, your father introduces you to it and then you're doing it and you're obviously having fun doing it and you're seeing him have success. At one point, do you think that this is something you want to do for a living, that you actually want to become a pro fighter? Because that's a big leap, you know, for a lot, you know, a lot of kids, regular folk, they do it for fun, but they don't take that next step. You, Jack, took that next step. When did that happen for you? Yeah, again, quite difficult to say, to be honest. Really? Um, I just kind of always known that I wanted to do it. Like, a suit. obviously, when I was six, seven, I didn't know that you could really do that kind of stuff. But when I was like 14, 15, I started being around like MMA fighters and stuff who were in the UFC, like doing it for a job. And I, I just thought, you know what? This is what I want to do. I want to do this. So pretty much since then, obviously, I've had moments where I've not wanted to do it as well. I've wanted to do other stuff. But yeah, I've just always had this self-belief that I can do it. And obviously, it's paying off at the moment. Um, for you to have that victory on uh, on Saturday and, and, and for your winning ways to continue to remain undefeated, but then, unfortunately, in the main event, your good friend and teammate, Darren Till, you know, has a tough night. Was it hard to celebrate? Was it hard to be happy? Because I'm sure you were bummed for him as well, but you also got the 50 Gs. You were on top of the – how do you mix, you know, like the emotions of you're thrilled, but your your friend is feeling down, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, as well? Yeah, it, that's kind of tough, to be honest. Yeah. That is kind of tough. That's happened before as well. Um, it's, a, it's a tough thing because you want to celebrate, but you also don't want to celebrate so much that it's kind of rubbing it in somebody else's face, especially like a good friend. Right. Uh, and I think, I think it's the same for the team as well. Obviously there was, it wasn't just me until there, there was like six, seven of us and everyone was kind of happy for me, but sad for Till. And it, it's just difficult. It's a, it's a bit of an awkward situation that is to be in, but I guess this is the sport. This is the, uh, the good and the bad things about the sport. Yeah. Yeah, you, you want to be on top of the world. You want to celebrate. You want to be on the phone. But, you know, I don't know if you flew back together, but, like, it's, it's just, yeah, I can't imagine, and especially back-to-back -back fights. So there's not even that separation there, first fight of the night, main event, or something like that. Um, he always talks you up. He's he's had your back. What's your relationship like with him? Me and Till? Yeah. Uh, I think he likes me. I, I don't like him that much, to be <laughs> honest. So... No, we're friends. We're good friends. I've known me and Till have known each other for a long time. In recent years, I think we've be become a lot better friends. Me and Till are completely different personalities. You know what I mean? But yeah. uh, <laughs> I don't know a lot of people we, like Darren Till, if I'm being honest. Yeah, he's odd guy. Odd yeah, guy. Yeah. No, to be honest, he's very he's very misunderstood, Darren Till. I feel amongst the people, he, he's a lovely guy. To be to be completely honest, I know. Obviously, I'm saying bad stuff about him, but I am only joking. Yes. He is actually a really, he's a really nice person deep down. You know, forgetting, forgetting all the stuff and the way that he acts sometimes for the cameras and stuff. Deep down, he's, he's a good guy. Uh, I know he is a good guy as well. I, I think he uh, sometimes will push the, the limits a little bit, but, you know, those are the characters that people are drawn to in our sport. Um, I think that there is a, you know, you know the heavyweight division. It's it's relatively thin. It's always relatively thin, and you got a big guy like you finishing people the way you're finishing them from the UK. I would imagine there's a desire to you know put you on a rocket ship, but you're saying nah, chill. Let's chill out a little bit, right? You're saying I don't. I need a little more time. You know, how how do you feel about the next couple fights that are going to come your way? Because there isn't that much room right now between you and I'm not saying you're fighting Francis and Ganu in six months, but you know how it is. Heavyweight, it's a little bit different than say bantamweight or lightweight. Yeah, it's kind of the gift and the curse of the heavyweight division. Yeah. Like you can get up there quick. You know, the reason why I'm I always talk about taking it slow and stuff like that is because uh a lot of people get it confused and think that I'm not very confident. And I think it's completely the opposite. I think that the fact is I'm very confident in myself and my own ability. I'm just aware enough to know that I need more experience to compete with these guys who have had multiple five round fights and my, none of my fights have even gone past like a round and a half yet. So I need to like this experience. You can't buy this stuff. Like this is, 
very valuable and I'm completely aware that I need that stuff to compete with these guys. That's that's what they've got over me. Like I feel like I've got a lot of other stuff over me. Speed, power, skill, all this kind of stuff. Like I feel I've got that over most of the guys. But one thing that I've not got, which is also very important, is the experience. So I want to build that up. And another thing is, what's the damn rush? What's the rush in this thing? Like, I'm 28. Like, everywhere it's go to early 40s. I want to stick around. I'm not trying to be a flash in the pan. Right. I'm not trying to go. I'm not trying to be like a hype job, as we say in the UK. I'm trying to be like, I want to earn my way up. I want to take out these guys and get the experience on the way and and do my thing and enjoy myself and make money and, and improve as I'm going. I'm not just trying to get there because everyone thinks I'm good and then turns out I'm not good and then I have to go back to work in a regular job. Like I don't want to do that shit. No. I wanna I wanna I wanna earn my way up and, and enjoy this stuff and provide for my family on the way and when I get there I wanna stay there as well. So in your mind, how long before you're fighting in those big significant fights? Like two, three, four years? I would say about about thirty seven years, something like that. Thirty seven years? You mean thirty seven yeah, years yeah. old? No, 30, 37 oh, you, years. <laughs> You're really wanting to take it slow. No, I, I don't know. I, I think... You, you'll, you'll be Evander Holyfield's age, who's fighting this weekend. Yeah, I don't really want to be that old. I'm just no, playing. No. But uh, I think... I don't know. You, you have to look at the other heavyweights, don't you? Like, the prime heavyweights are usually between 35 and 40. Yeah. Usually. Usually. Cyril Gahn, pretty young. How old is he? How old is that guy? Well, he's only been doing it for three years, but he might be one of those late. Let's see. Let's see. Give me a second. Give me a second. He is 31. So still yeah, three so years he's still, older than you. Yeah. He's still three. He's three years older than me. So I'm going to say 31 then. Okay. Same age as him. Like he, he's doing good for himself. He's doing great. I think he's amazing. Um, I've also met him a few times. Cool guy. I like his coach also. Cool guy. And uh, I think he's doing good stuff. Did you ever go to those... Uh, UFCs in the UK in the early days when you were growing up? Were you ever in attendance for any of those? Oh, Ariel, of course I've been there. Of course I have. Which one? Of Which one? Oh, I don't know the numbers. I was when I was there when I can tell you exactly. Tell me. This is what this is one of the moments actually that got me into MMA that, that made me realise that I want to do it. Is when Michael Bisping, our friend Mikey B. Yeah. DJ for Mikey. L for that's the one, DJ Mal Mikey B from Clitheroe. He fought Elvis Sinisic. Oh, yeah. That was a, was that a fight night? Was that a fight night in England? Or was it UFC? So you were in attendance? I was in attendance. And I'll tell you the exact moment that I wanted to do this thing. Oh, wow. I can okay. tell you the exact Now moment. here you are going back to my previous question and answering it in a better way. This is amazing. I am. Um, I apologize. That no was problem. a bit of a bad, bad interview thing from me but what happened was Terry Etim you know Terry of course Terry Etim yeah so my dad has been you know coaching down at the gym for a long long time Terry Etim obviously part of the gym so we went to the weigh-ins in Manchester and I must have been at this time 14 years old or something like that I don't even think I was doing MMA training at the time I think I'd done a bit of jujitsu, done a bit of boxing and stuff like that and I remember we got there to the weigh-ins and I was just expecting like a small thing. I'm just going to watch Terry weigh in and it's going to be pretty cool. That's sort what of I was expecting. We got there. It was absolutely packed. We were sat up in the nosebleeds and Andre Olofsky walked on the scales oh. and he was wearing some cream. Um, I don't know what you guys would call it. We would call it joggers, maybe like a, like sweatpants. Like sweatpants. Yeah, 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 sweatpants, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, and he had the no T-shirt on, and he had the big cross around his neck, and he was ripped, and he was big, and, I rem and he had the fangs in, I think, and he had the long, he had the long hair as well. Mm -hmm. And I remember he, he put his arm up when he stepped on the scales, and the crowd went absolutely insane. And that was the moment I thought, I've got to do this stuff, man. Like, I want to be that guy. And you just fought and beat that guy in your last fight, two fights ago. That's absurd. That's right. That's right. Was that but, surreal for you? Did you think about that kid? If I could have told that kid sitting in the nosebleeds that I'd beat up that guy in the cream joggers, he never would have believed. Or maybe he would have. I don't know. 
no, no, I didn't believe in myself in them days. Um, yeah, it's a crazy, crazy experience, absolutely crazy. But uh, at the time when I fought Olofsky, I didn't, I didn't really think about it. But thinking back, I'm like, shit, that is, that is really something. Uh, by the way, that's a great event. I thought it was seven. I'm usually really good at this stuff. I'm getting older. UFC 70 is the classic one where Gabriel Gonzaga knocks uh, knocks out Mirko Krokop and his freaking leg, you know, bends. Like, you were there for that fight. That was a great card. I was there, yeah. Wow. Epic. Absolutely epic. I've been to so many. Uh, I've been to most of the UK cards. Oh, I've really? been to most of the UK cards. Yeah, I'm, I've been a fan of this stuff for a long time. To be honest, these days, I actually watch it a lot less than I used to watch it. Um, I don't really, I don't really keep up with it much anymore. Because you're like immersed in it, right? You need a bit of a mental break. Exactly. When it comes to the weekend, man, I just want to spend time with my kids and not think about this stuff. Like, I, I don't really fan over it anymore. The only really, the only real division that I keep tabs on is like the heavyweight division. Really, I don't really, I don't really know any of what's happening in any other divisions. A lot of people like to bring up the fact that you've sparred uh, Tyson Fury. Right. And, and, and they forget that, you know, you have the BJJ background and all that stuff. And they was, oh, his striker, Tyson Fury. How many times did you actually spar him? I've sparred him a lot of times, a lot of times. Um, I remember at one point, this is when. So I was sparring Tyson. So the Fury family, Peter Fury, who's Tyson Fury's old coach, is his uncle. Uh, he's good friends with my father. So. I've known the I've known the Fury family and and John Fury and his brothers and cousins and everything like that for a long time. Um, the first time he ever sparred Tyson Fury was when he fought Christian Hammer, which was before his Klitschko fight. So I was a I was young man. I don't know how old I was then. I was young as hell. Uh, and yeah, I sparred him. I remember he had the break after the Klitschko fight, and he got really fat. Like I don't know, he was and. I used to go in and spar him like three times a week. Like he, he said, he didn't want to do any running. He was too fat to run, and he didn't want to do any bag work or anything like that because he found it boring. He just wanted to spar with me, so we do we do ten rounds three times a week just to help him get his weight down. Wow! And you were the guy. Yeah, I was. That was just helping him get his weight down. I sparred him for a lot of his camps as well. I sparred him for the Klitschko camp a little bit. Um, sparred him for a couple of fights after and all that kind of stuff. How out of shape was he? Like, how bad was it? He was out, he, he was really fat, but do you know what? He's one of the most talented people, probably the most talented person I've ever seen mm -hmm. do anything in my life. He's unbelievable. Like, he was really, really fat to the point where, like, he could hardly, and he'll tell you this himself, do you know what I mean? I'm not trying to, like, say anything yeah, yeah. bad about him. Of course. Um, he could hardly, like, move around. Wow. I'm not talking about, like, exercising. I'm talking about, he could hardly like walk around. He was wow. that fat, and he would just get in and he would just spar ten rounds, like no problem. I'll tell you a good story, actually. I'll tell you a really good story. Please, please. Do you know? You know, I, I've seen that you interviewed him, Daniel Dubois. You know that, of course. Guy, right? Yes, dynamite, dynamite, Daniel Dubois. Right. One day, this is when Tyson was retired from boxing before he made his comeback. Uh, Tyson didn't show up to the gym for months, like months and months. One day, Daniel Dubois was in the gym to spar Tyson's cousin, Huey Fury. And this one particular day, there was a lot of people in the gym. Like, Daniel Dubois had a bit of an entourage, and Huey had a bit of an entourage as well. And one of Huey's entourage was Tyson. And Tyson, he, he hadn't put a pair of boxing gloves on for, I don't know how long at the time, maybe like six months or so. I don't know exactly, but... He was really fat and out of shape. I'd not seen him for months. And he came in the gym. And I remember he had like regular clothes on. Like he didn't have like workout clothes or anything. He didn't have a, like a mouthpiece. He didn't have any hand wraps. He didn't even have any gloves or anything. He had like shoes on. And I remember he took his pants off and he just had boxer shorts on. I think he had a vest on or something like that. And he was really fat, like really fat. So he was just there to watch the spar. He wasn't there to actually spar. Didn't put any hand wraps on, and he got like a, I don't know what you guys would call it, we call it like gaffer tape, like mm. duct tape, you know, like thick tape. Yeah. And he, he, ta he taped his ankles up to his shoes, <laughs> didn't wrap his hands, didn't have a mouthpiece, and he got in there and sparred Daniel Dubois, and he was he had no fitness. He didn't spar him for many rounds, maybe like two or three rounds. And the, the spar, the, the technique that he showed and, and the skills that he showed in that spar was 
absolutely mind blowing. Wow. There was a lot of people in the there was a lot of people in the room that day. There was maybe like 60, 70 people in the room that day, and everybody left being like, "What have I just seen?" Wow, that was unbelievable. Wow, what a legend! Uh, and hopefully, we'll see him back October 9th against uh, Deontay Wilder. By the way, you've had one pro boxing fight, right? How come? Uh, how come not more than that? Oh, that's a long story, Ariel. Okay. I don't want to bore. I don't want to bore the view. I don't want to bore the viewers. Okay, interesting. I don't, don't want to bore you. I don't want to bore you. It's it's a long story, man. I'm political. You, okay. Uh, do you want to go back to boxing at some point? Or are you happy with this? If you never fight in a boxing match again, are you okay with that? I would be open to it. I'd be open to it for sure. But my goal is to win the UFC title. Really, I'd, if if we can do some kind of crossover shit, like I would be up for it. I'm not trying to fight a YouTuber though. Like, Why not? Everyone's I making money off of it. It's a great life. Well, I guess so. Yeah, I mean, money is nice. <laughs> money, money is nice. I guess so. Yeah. What's that? Who's a heavyweight YouTuber? No, I don't know. I don't know if one of those exists. I mean, Logan Paul is pretty big, by the way, but I don't know if he's heavyweight. He's like one ninety, maybe two hundred. Yeah, that's not that's that's not big compared to me, though. Oh no. Uh, what are you need, like? Forty. Uh, on a good day. On a good day. Wow. Yeah, I'm more, I'm more like uh, if I if I'm not training, I'll, I'll be too. 260. Right, but when you weighed in on Friday, what were you? 247, I think, or 248, okay. something like that. By the way, what's up with your tattoos? This one over here. I'm getting it. I'm getting them fixed soon. Okay. I'm getting them fixed. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this one. This yeah, one. what's going on there? What is that? So I'll tell you what it is. I got my BJJ black belt, and then I was like, I'm getting a black belt tattoo. Okay. Let's go for it. All right. So then I said to my friend who does the tattoos, look, I'm gonna, I want to get this uh, black belt tattooed around my wrist. So he said, all right, cool. So he put the stencil and started tattooing and stuff. We got like halfway through the tattoo and I was like, but I didn't have any of the, like these. I didn't have nothing else at the time. It was just that. And then I was like, do you know what, mate? I don't want the black belt tattoo. It's fucking corny. Uh. Let, let's just do it. Let's just do a black ring around it. Let's just go for the black ring. So yeah, that's what I've got these days. Just wow, a black ring. I dig it. I mean, I feel like that would hurt. Like that's a lot of ink in one, you know, condensed spot. No. Yeah, it was painful actually. Um, I'm actually getting this. I just messaged my tattoo artist just before I spoke to you. Actually, okay. This, this. I don't know if you can see how bad this thing is. Yeah. I got I this when I was like, I don't know, fifteen. Okay. I was still at school. Okay. Terrible, absolutely terrible tattoo. I'm, what, uh, what is that? Candy this, canes or something? Fixed. It looks like Christmas candy canes. It might as well be. It's absolutely terrible. But like in the UK, we um, we wear uniforms for school. I don't know if you do. Do you do that in Canada? Yeah, yeah. No? Some, some schools, not mine, but yeah, some schools. I'm not talking because uh, I brought this up in America, and they were like, "Oh, you went to private school?" I was like, "Fuck! If you've seen where I'm from, you know that private schools do not exist where I'm from." So no, it wasn't a private school, but. Uh, yeah, I used to think I was like the man because I would have my, my school shirt on, my tie, and I would have like a tattoo underneath. And I was like, yeah. But uh, terrible tattoo. I'm getting it covered next week, I think. Um, PT Carroll told me that you represent Wigan. But then I, I tweeted that you're the pride of Wigan. And everyone's like, no, 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 not Wigan, not Wigan. So I don't know if PT was giving me false information. Like on, on your bio, it doesn't say Wigan. It says... It says Salford, Greater Manchester. So is that Wigan? I don't know. It's hard for me to know with all the you know the different neighborhoods. I'm sick of this uh, misinformation area all the time. Yeah, yeah. As to where I'm from. Let's right. So I'll air. tell you. I'll, I'll clear the air for everybody watching. Please. People, people think I'm from Liverpool. I have never ever claimed that I'm from Liverpool in my life. Liverpool is a beautiful place. I have a lot of scouts friends, but that's not me. I train there. I train there. That's it. Now. I was born in a place called Salford, Greater Manchester. Okay. And so that's why it comes up as Salford. I don't live there. I live in a place called Atherton. Okay. okay. Right, this place, this place, Atherton, is a place in Greater Manchester. Okay. But it, it comes under the Wigan area as well. It's ah, really strange. Okay, okay. But people who are actually from Wigan wouldn't say that we're from Wigan. So it's really weird. It's like nobody wants us, Ariel. Nobody okay. wants us, really. Wow, so you're just yeah, kind of that, stuck in between all these different neighborhoods. Yeah, I I would say I'm from Greater Manchester. Like okay. That's where I'm from. Uh, Atherton, Greater Manchester. But I wouldn't say that I was from Wigan, really, because they don't want us, you see. We want to be wanted. Yeah. You know, I'm from, the, I'm from this place where 
Um, it's a nice, it's a nice little place, but it's like nobody here really has any ambition, and I'm trying to show people like, look, you can do whatever you want to do if you want to. Like, it's just that people, it's like kind of got the small town mentality. Like, people really don't do a lot from this place apart from like, um, you know, just like work in factories or sell drugs or all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, I'm not saying working in factories and all that stuff no, no, at I all. I'm just, I'm just saying, like, if you want to do other stuff as well, like, go for it. Okay, so let's end on that note. Who do you want next? Oh, good question. Good question. Uh, I would love to fight Black or Ivanov. You know, I've, mm-hmm. I've watched him for so long. I've watched him for so long. I know there's a lot of good fights coming up. There's a lot of good fights coming up in the heavyweight division. A lot of the top fifteen, they're already tied up. Uh, they're all fighting one another anyway, so it's probably not going to be any time soon. Plus, I got to go to the hospital tomorrow because I have a sore hand. Oh, so we'll see what's happening with that. But uh, yeah, I like Blago Ivanov. I think that's a good fight. I think there's a lot of good fights out there for me. You know, uh, I've seen that Augusto Sakai doesn't have a match. Um, there's loads. There's loads. There's so many good fights. I don't want to really call one guy right, out because enough. I'm not. Lo- you're not, not that like guy. To... You you said to Bisping, "I'm not that guy. I'm not that guy." So I don't want to make. You I just want I you know I want to deserve my shot. Yeah. I don't. I'm not trying. I'm not trying to be a hype job. I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to. Uh, I'm trying to fight everybody in this thing. You know what I mean? I'm trying to beat everybody. I'm not trying to just be like this is the guy I want because I don't just want one person. I don't want to be a faker. I'm not trying to fake the whole world and say create some fake beef with somebody. I want to test my skills against everybody. So. Um, yeah, whatever. Well, this has been lovely, my friend. I'm so glad that you finally agreed to come on and give us some time. Uh, luckily, we got you before you know you really reached that next level, skyrocketed to the top of the rankings, and became a huge star. And we forget all about us. So we can say, hey, you know, we had Tom on before he was a superstar. Don't forget about us. So please uh, remember us when you become. <laughs> A big Are you taking the piss? No, 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 not at all. I mean, that's uh, listen. What do you mean? What do you mean? Thanks for coming. I've been wanting to go on this shit for ages. <laughs> but I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna message you and be like, Ariel, please let me on. Please let me on the show. No, I'm not gonna because last time I spoke piss. to you, last time I spoke to you, man, uh, Peasy, he was like, Oh, I know Ariel. Do you want me to message him and ask if you can be on? I'm like, Peasy, come on. I'm not a beg. Yeah, like, I'm not. I'm. I'm not this beg. I'm not gonna be like, Ariel, please let me on. It it all worked so, out for the best. Here we are. I was taking the piss. Uh, very happy for your success. You're doing great things. I'm looking forward to watching your rise. Enjoy the victory and looking forward to the next one as well. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Ariel. I've just got one more thing to say before I leave. Uh-oh. Yes? Yes. <laughs> hey, you pulled the chill sun in. I had a feeling I, I, I had a feeling that he was going to go in that direction, and that's great. Only the best do that. Chael Sonnen, Ally Quinta, Tom Aspinall quickly climbing up the leaderboard for one of our favorite guests. I mean, between Jack and Molly and and Tom, we got Patty coming up. This, you know, this is a feel good show right here. If I'm being honest, great stuff from Tom Aspinall. Twenty eight, undefeated in the UFC, eleven and two overall, four victories, all in either the first or second round. The uh, Arlovsky win was in the second round. The win on Saturday, 11-2. and two, um, That was what he improved to, win over Sergei Spivak. Um, first round, TKO. Brilliant display. That's a name to remember, Tom Aspinall. And he is 1-0 in, uh, in boxing. Not quite sure what that whole situation is about, but... Uh, we'll see. By the way, uh, Ariel Hawani, or one day we'll find out. Hopefully, maybe one day. I don't know. Maybe he doesn't ever want to talk about it. I, you know, I don't want to. Pri- I'm not. I'm not that guy either. I'm not a prior. You know, I'm not a prior. You don't want to talk about it. All right, hands up. Uh, Ariel Helwani. Substack. Com is the website where you can leave questions, and uh, we will get to those at the end of the show. For now, though, let us go to our next guest. And let me tell you, like I said, we're. we're I mean, it's just a feel good show today. Feel good show, good vibes, good people, no hatred, no toxicity, none of that. And we continue with that theme 
And uh, we talked to the man who will be headlining the next UFC event. That's September 18th in Las Vegas against Ryan Spann. He's the one and only. He's one of my favorites in the game. One of the smartest people in MMA. Turned into a pretty damn good analyst as well. The one and only Anthony Lionheart Smith. Kind enough to join us here. Anthony, how are you? I'm good, Harold. How are you? I don't know if you saw, but it's like you and a bunch of European fighters on today's show. You know, one of these things is not like the other. But, you know, you're the guy. You're the guy right in the middle leading the charge. I don't know if you saw that. No, I didn't see it. I've been training all morning. Oh, so I jumped man. right on here. All right. All right. Well, I apologize. I uh, took time out of my day. Yes. To come here and speak to my man, Ariel. That means a lot. I was just getting emotional talking about the people who take time out of their day to come on and speak to me. By the way, I also did mention you didn't hear this, and I hope you don't mind. I said, pound for pound, you're one of the best texters in MMA because, you know, I'll say, <laughs> Anthony, can you come on at 930? You write, okay, period. Anthony, how are you? I'm doing well, period. I mean, the punctuation, that you, I don't know how you keep up with it. I don't know how you don't just want to fire off the text, but I think a lot of people should know this about you. You're a phenomenal texter. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I don't, it bothers me when – it actually doesn't bother me if other people don't use correct punctuation and it's, or it's like spelling. I don't give – my wife is a terrible texter. Like, if she can abbreviate any word, she absolutely will. But uh, I don't know. I just it bothers me if I don't put the correct punctuation in there. I respect it. Um, so where are we right now? We're in Colorado. Yeah, I'm in Denver right now. Getting ready for the fight September 18th, Ryan Spann. I have to ask you, Anthony. I was watching the broadcast on uh, Saturday afternoon, the card on ESPN Plus. And they show a great promo, a little package, two, three minutes on this fight in the middle of the card. Really well done. Got me hyped for the fight. And I don't know if you saw it, but my takeaway, and I know others shared the same sentiment because I saw some tweets. Ryan, to me, came across as very mad in that in that package. And I don't know if he was playing a character or something, but did you see this video? And why is he so upset? Why is he so fired up for this? I didn't see it live. Okay. Um, but I had enough people reach out that I was like, well, all right, maybe I'll go back and watch and see what this is about. Um, I don't know. What a nerd. <laughs> I just laughed at it the whole time. Like, what are you so mad about? I he just, it, it sounds like a, it sounds a, a, a lot of like trying to convince himself, you know, like, why does he, I mean, I, you know, obviously the producers and stuff and that are like, cause those weren't like super feel good moments for me. Uh, I think you and I have talked on your show before about like those moments were, you know, initially very happy, but there's a lot of sadness that comes with that, you know? Um, so I don't brag and throw in people's face. So like, it sounds like a bunch of shit that's bothering him that he's got to convince himself. But, uh, and then at the end, he hit me with the old uh, Watchman quote when Rorschach was in, was in prison. <laughs> like, you're not locked in there. With, you know, like, I'm not locked in there with you. You're locked in there with me. Like, get out of here. You fucking dork. Like, I, 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 listen, I don't want to take this too deep because it's, I don't, I'm, there's no beef there. Um, I definitely don't have his respect, which is fine. Um, I will, uh, you know, next Saturday night. And I promise you that. But, um, I, it's, he's not scary to me because he's big, strong, and black. Like, he's like every single cousin I have on my dad's side. Like, it's not super intimidating to me. So I don't know. Maybe he's not used to that, but, <laughs> Big black scary guys don't don't make me nervous. Okay, so you said something that was really interesting there. You said um, you don't think that that he respects you. Now I'm wondering, do you respect him? Because also in that clip, um, and let's be honest, like you have fought the best of the best, as you reminded us, and you have been around for a long time. And you know, there's there's not a big name from John Jones on down who you haven't at this point fought. You were like, ah, I fought a bunch of Ryan Spans early in my career, like this. Do you respect him, or is this kind of like a tune-up fight for you in your view? No, it's it's the furthest thing from a tune-up fight for me. Um, he's dangerous. He's he's one of the more dangerous guys that I've faced in a long time. Uh, super powerful. He, he's athletic. He's he's really he's big. He moves well. He, he has a lot of positive things to his game. Um, I respect his abilities for sure. I respect his 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 attributes. I respect his skills. Uh, I just don't like, I don't, I guess I, I, I don't talk about him. Like, I don't really know him. I, I have gotten a vibe that he doesn't like me. Um, we've been in the same place before. Like we've been in, you know, in situations where we're very 
very close to each other. And I just get this vibe. He's, he just doesn't like me, which is like, you don't have to like everybody, but like, sometimes I do wonder, like, I feel like I'm a kind of a hard guy to like dislike. So I, I don't know what that's about, but honestly, I don't, I don't give a shit either way. Okay. So there is, I was, that was actually my next question. Like, is there some prior thing between you guys, some prior issue? It sounds like there's something. I, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Maybe I, I don't think I've said anything about him. I don't typically just go off on people that, you know, kind of aren't in my lane. Um, and he hasn't been in my lane until we booked this fight, you know? So I, I've never really thought about him before. I've never paid attention when he fights. I've never, I don't think I've ever done, said anything in, in an interview that, that could be, I don't know, perceived as, as disrespect. Um, you know, me and Uriah Hall had some beef for a little while, like a long time ago, but in, you know, a couple of years ago, Uriah and I squashed that and, and it's been nothing but, you know, it's been nothing but love when Uriah and I see each other. I've been nothing but respectful to his coach um, and, and how, and how he's done with his team and, and, and how successful he's been, you know, I'm a, I'm a big safe fan. So um, yeah, I, I don't know. And it, that's what I mean. Like some of that stuff is, it, that's his own insecurities. You know what I mean? Like it, it, He's the one who kept talking, you know, about uh, this is a main event and, and I'm not nervous. Or like, you're the one that keeps talking about it. Yeah. Like, this is just every, this is everyday shit for me. You're the one that keeps bringing it up. Um, you know, I was talking about you on Saturday, uh, you know, outside of this fight, um, I was doing a, a post fight show with my friends, PT and Chuck, and we were talking about Darren Till. And what I said was, Darren Till needs to look at someone like Anthony Smith. What Anthony Smith did was, all right, I'm, I'm fighting killer after killer, top contender after top contender, back to back to back to back. And maybe sometimes, and I don't think we do it enough in our sport. I don't mean I'm the one doing it, but I, I don't think it's a thing, especially in the UFC because everyone's so good, um, especially in the upper echelon, a tune-up fight in the sense that, hey, maybe you take a step back and don't fight a top five guys continuously. You fight top 15, top 13, top 16 and you did that now the jimmy crute win i would say is probably one of your most impressive victories because he was on this rocket ship and you just looked amazing it was just a huge win on a big card but you took that step back and you know start to build your mojo back your confidence back is that a fair assessment of where you're currently at in your career you assessed all right it wasn't going well we talked about it ad nauseum glover all that stuff took a tiny step back and now look at you two fight winning streak still headlining still in big fights but maybe the the caliber isn't quite the same until you get three, four, five in a row, and then we're back to fighting those top caliber guys. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to make it to four or five in a row before I have to before you know I'm back in those those top five guys and title contention stuff. But you think it, less? It wasn't initial. Yeah, I think okay. it's less. I don't think there's a choice because so far they're not. They had the last two haven't been super competitive. So. Um, and, you know, the UFC is not going to keep doing that. I, I think, I, I think the UFC's idea was that, you know, I kind of stubbed my toe a couple of times at the top. Um, and I think it's a, a, it's a sink or swim moment for me. I don't know if it's such a kumbaya moment where it's like, all right, let's let him get back on his feet and, and figure it out from there. I think it's more like, all right, like if you're not beating the top five guys, you got to defend your spot versus these young upper comers. Um, and, and, and I'm willing to do that because, you know, I, I hate the term company guy, but like UFC's, been very good for my career my and, and me personally and, and my own personal growth and success. So, you know, I'll do the, I'll do the heavy lifting. Nobody wants to fight Jimmy crew. No one wants to fight Ryan Spann. Um, there's just, those just aren't super fun guys to fight. They're really, really tough. There's not a lot of, a lot of stuff you gain from that and it's going to not be very much fun most likely. So, um, but yeah, I mean, essentially that's what it came down to is, is at the top of every division, you have guys who are specialists, right. And, and guys that are just, really good at keeping the fight in, in their kind of arena and the rest of the division are, it's, it's like, I know Ryan Spann takes his disrespect when I say that there's nothing that stands out about him. I don't mean that by, I'm not saying he's not good. I'm just saying he's not a, he's not a Olympic medalist wrestler. He's not a multiple time world champion grappler. He's not 150 and one as a kickboxer. He doesn't do one thing overly better than the rest of his skills. So I don't have to worry about shit when I'm in training camp. We just have to go in and, and we evaluate the places that he's dangerous. And then we just try to get, you know, I just try to sharpen my sword the best I can. I, and, and that's the best part about this. You know, like when you're fighting guys like Rackage, like he's uh, the thing that stands out of a Rackage is a, he's a monster kicker. Like they, he just, 
change. I mean, he, he outkicked Tiago Santos. Nobody does that. Um, he, he battered my leg with two leg kicks where I couldn't barely stand. Like you got a guy like Glover, who's got a nasty left hook and his jujitsu is fucking fire. You know, like, you, you know, you got Jan Blachowicz, crazy top game, really crazy power in his left hand. Like there's things like that. And all those guys, you can kind of figure out like what their thing is. Jimmy Crew doesn't have that thing. Devin Clark doesn't have that thing. And Ryan Span doesn't have that thing. So I just, I can just train freely and just try to be as good as I can. Uh, so being in that position and, and fighting down in the rankings a little bit has allowed me to do that and just focus on myself. Did you feel like you were being kind of served up to Jimmy Crute? He was a guy that they have high hopes for, and he's young. Did you feel like on that card, this was supposed to be a stepping stone fight for him and it didn't quite go that way? Uh, I, I think that it was one of those situations where it didn't matter either way. If if I won, uh, I'm already I'm already popular. I'm already kind of established in the division. Uh, and I just proved myself, you know, the, the old dog beats the young up and comer. It's an easy story to sell. And, and it blows Jimmy crew through the roof if he beats me. So I think it's a win-win situation for the UFC. And I think that's why they made that fight. Um, and so after that fight, were you expecting a big name? Did, like, as you said, you, it's not going to be, you know, three, four fights. Were you expecting, again, not trying to rag on, on span at all, but like, did you think you would get yeah. a top tier guy? Were you disappointed with this booking? No, I expected Stan. I expected Stan. And I didn't, I didn't have a lot of time to think about it either. Uh, and maybe this is where he gets so pissed off at me because I've told this story since now that the fight is actually happening. Uh, they booked, they offered me the racket fight or the, the Stan fight a week after my last fight on short notice. And he accepted it right away. Uh, we, I don't remember who, I don't remember who ended up fighting, but they needed a main event like the, the very next weekend. And, I said, yeah, that I, I would jump in and I would fight Ryan Spann. And he said yes initially, like right away, and then called back and then decided not to fight. Um, said it was a weight cut issue or something. And I, I suspect that he probably jumped the gun, decided to fight and said, yeah, I'll do it. And then talked to his coaches and they said, no, that's probably a stupid idea. Because uh, um, I don't, because I just fought and he, I don't know if he'd been training. So, um, and then. So I, I just kind of started getting into vacation mode. And the very next week, the exact same situation happened. Same deal. Ryan Span, week's notice, main event. I said, yeah, let's do it. And then he said uh, he said no again. So Whoa. I suspected that that was the fight they were going to make. So I I just told that story recently. I'm not trying to shit on him. I'm just yeah. – that's that's why I expected this was going to be the matchup because this is the one they wanted I wonder, a, week, a week after I fought. I wonder why this was the one that they wanted so badly. Do you know? I, I don't know. Um, they'd come with Johnny Walker before. Um, and I, it was a date thing. It was a date thing. Cause like once he said no, the second time I was like, all right, I'm done until September. I'm not fighting at all. Cause I take the summers off with my kids. Um, so then they'd come with Johnny Walker, but Johnny didn't want to wait. And I, and I'm, and I'm not, I'm not cutting my summers off unless it's a title shot. So, um, and then they said, and then they said Ryan Spann didn't want to wait. And I was like, well, I guess we'll figure it out, you know, at the end of the summer. And, and then he came back and said he'd wait. When are we going to see Anthony Smith in the booth? I I don't know. I don't know. I hope soon. Um, want to do it? I, I do. I do. I really like calling live fights. Um, I really love working the desk, though. That's a lot of fun. Um, I think you'd be great at that. You know, I've done it on the regional scene before. Um you know, I've done it for James Krause's show, um, and I've done it um, just to, you know, on like smaller regional shows. But I, I think that I kind of have to wait my spot, wait for my turn because kind of the U.S. stable of guys is kind of set. Like, I don't deserve an opportunity, you know, of head of biz being or DC or Felder or you know Dom. But I would I would guess that there's <laughs> those guys are probably going to want to stay stateside when we start traveling again. They're not going to want to do all the international shows. And, and that's kind of the route that Felder took. You know, Felder was on the road doing the UK shows and, you know, Russia and Brazil and, and kind of the places that maybe DC didn't want to. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, unfortunately, you know, as much as I, I really like Dan Hardy, you know, he kind of did open up a spot for the, the you know, that international group and, you know, European scene. Yes. So maybe when we start traveling again. Yeah, that would be great. I think you're great. I, like I said, I think you're one of the best on the uh, 
on the desk. I've told you that privately as well. Um, did you like that? Is that how did that how does that even start? Did you ask to be a part of that, or did you kind of backdoor no. someone no, asked you to try to? I never that? had any. Yeah, I never. It, honestly, it, it I've, I've given a lot of credit. Obviously, you know, Zach Candido's given me fantastic opportunities, but if it wasn't for Dan Hardy, I don't think I would have ever been in any of these positions. Really? Uh, when I fought, yeah, when I fought Shogun Hua uh, in uh, Germany, uh, Dan was working that event and I'd never, you know, it was my first main event. So they never spent a bunch of time with me, like in production meetings and, you know, trying to figure out who I am. And I, I went in and, you know, Zach's in the meeting and, and Lappy's there and, and Dan is there. And we just start talking about fights. We're not even talking about, my fight is me and Dan are just rapping back and forth about, you know, philosophies and approaches and, and we're just geeking out. And we realized like, you know, Zach goes like, all right, guys, we've been here 20 minutes. We haven't even talked about your fight. <laughs> so we didn't, you know, we talked about it a little bit, but then they, they want, they added this thing they, what they called Facebook live to my media schedule. And it was just me, Dan, two chairs and two microphones. And they just turned it on and we just talked. So then from then on, that was always part of my media schedule. And it was just this new thing that me and Dan did. And they just put it out on Facebook live. So then from there, Dan had a serious XM uh, radio show at the time he was hosting. And every, the Tuesday after every pay-per-view, Dan asked me to come on and we would just talk about fights. It would, you know, the, the fallout from the main event, co-main event, where's the winner go, where's the loser go, you know, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Uh, and he called it the lion's den. I thought it was like super cool. Well then Dan couldn't, do it anymore because his USC schedule was really ramping up. So he gave me his radio show. That's how I had my radio show on Sirius XM. Wow. So then I started, I started hosting it with RJ. Uh, and then John Jones was getting ready to fight Alexander Gustafson. And at that time I had done the lion's den. I had a lot of added media obligations because I was doing really well with that, with, you know, kind of break down fights and, and I guess able to, I don't know, just able to not sound like an idiot, I guess. And, they asked me if I'd be, if I would, and I was getting close to a title shot. So uh, they asked if I'd be willing to, to come on and, and work the desk for that one event. And, you know, and then that's when Michael Bisbee kind of saved my ass because I was so scared. I was so nervous. Like really? I shelled up and yeah, I shelled up in the, uh, in the rehearsal and I was sitting next to Bisbee and he turned to me and said, Hey, if you get, you know, once we're live, if you get nervous or, or you get lost or you freeze, just look at me. I always got something to say. Uh -huh. So, uh, I never had to do that, but that, that, I guess that safety net, knowing that like if something bad happened and I freaked out that Bisming would be there to kind of save the day really helped me open up a lot. And then, you know, the, I got, I, they wanted, you know, they gave me another opportunity and it's just kind of steamrolled into where we are now. What I like about it is, is it's not, over the top. It's not too crazy colorful. It's analytical. It's well put, well thought. Um, I got to do it once with you in Houston. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, um, that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. Unfortunate circumstances because Chael, uh, Chael's wife got sick and so he had to leave. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we got... You know, I think sometimes I could I could put a little more energy into it. Meh, um, be yourself. I, yeah, that's, that's just not my style. Like I'm very analytical and, and I'm, I'm like, I'm very black and white. Like, here's what they're doing. Here's why they're doing it. Here's what they can do better. And, and, and I'll just, I just nerd out. Like I'm really good at nerding out on the techniques and explaining to people in a way that maybe makes, it helps the more casual fan understand why someone's doing something. But I, I'm never, I'm probably never going to be the Joe Rogan DC going crazy right, guy right. because I think I've just been in the sport too long. It's, it's going to take something like the Ben Askren you know, uh, Masvidal me to like get me super hype and out of my seat because I'm so dug into like what's going on technically that I, that's, and that's just not my style, man. I'm pretty laid back. True or false. John Jones will fight again. I mean, if you asked me that a couple months ago, I just said true for sure. I would say a very light true. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm bullish on it, but true. You're starting to lose hope. Yeah, I am. This is weird, right? This is a little weird. What's going on? I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know, man. I just, you know, I hate to, to, I always feel like I'm kind of stealing Chael's lines a little bit, but you don't get better at something by not doing it. Chael says that all the time. You don't get better at something by not doing it. So I, I just, 
you know, it, Father Time is undefeated. Right. And and John's been, you know, I don't think John gets enough credit. Like he's been in a lot of fights. He's been he's been in a couple wars recently. You know, in the the latter the latter part of his career, he's been in a lot of training camps too. Um, and 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 I don't say, I've been in there with the dude. We, I know that he, there's times where they said John wasn't training very hard. There's no way he he can, he can do a lot of the things that he does without without training at the highest level. So I've heard a lot of stories about guys that he's brought in. Like he's just spending money. He's bringing in monsters. I mean, that's, that's a lot of training camps for a lot of title fights. It's a lot of five rounders. That's a lot of, it's a lot of damage on your body sitting around isn't helping. So, um, what I don't want to happen is John to come back, lose if that, if that happens. And then it'd be because he had a long layoff and, and then whoever happens to be the one to beat him, it doesn't get the true credit that they would deserve for, mm -hmm. for doing that. Yeah. That, yeah, that would be unfortunate. I mean, you, you nailed it. Chell nailed it. Like, there's only that short window, and if you look at the last few performances, I thought Dominic Reyes beat him. Um, Tiago Santos took him to the distance. You took like it looked like he was becoming a lot more human, um, and so you wonder he comes back after this long layoff, especially in a bigger weight class. You know something might happen there. So uh, I was just curious to get your take on that. Glover or Jan? Who do you think wins? Oh man. I I, I don't know, and I, you know, I really like Jan. Huge, huge fan of him and how he how he carries himself. I think he's a fantastic champion, um, fantastic competitor. Uh, I hear nothing but good things about who he is as a person. Um, I'd love to drink beer with him sometime, um, but God damn it, I just I just need Glover to share it to win. Not because and not because he beat me and it makes me look better. Um, I, I I just think that like that man just deserves it. You know, like if, if Glover Teixeira can sail off into the sunset someday, at least for that moment in time, wearing a, a 12 pound gold belt around his waist, like I just think that that put a lot of good into the world that, that gives a lot of people like me hope and, and, you know, it motivates a lot of the older guys and, and it's just a feel good story. So I, I hope Glover, but you know, I, I think Glover can win as long as he avoids the big shot. Um, I think the, whichever guy can end up on top first, I would suspect will be the guy that ends up winning that fight because I, 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 I would guess if I'm Glover, I'm going in that fight, figuring out how to get to Jan's body without taking a huge shot in the process. Um, if, if Glover gets on top of him, uh, I don't, I don't see Jan getting back up. I don't see, I don't see Glover finishing him though. Um, but he, he's got the gas tank. He can wear him out. He can be heavy on top and just chip away at him like he did Tiago and, and, and me. <laughs> What a great story that would be. I mean, both guys so well liked. Um, you you hate and to say I, you know what, and I say that because like they both are deserving champions. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Like if if Glover wins, like they both get to be UFC world champions for whatever amount of time that ends up lasting for. But like you know, if like Jan wins, and that sucks because then only one of them gets to do that. And I think those are two guys that um, are both good enough to be world champions, uh, and they're both deserving of it. Uh, and I think that having both of those guys in the division, two older guys, two really good guys, like kind of the good guys in the division. It's, it's just one of those, like, you know, we don't have to be, I guess we don't have to be pricks to, to, to make it, you know, and, and to be successful. Well, this has been nice, Anthony, you know, nice to catch up main event fight coming up for you. You had a, a small little break in the, you had like this amazing run of, of main event fights. Uh, I had the little break with the, uh, Jimmy Crute, but now you're back September 18th, Ryan Spann, no drama. You know, you didn't, we didn't talk about anything that get anyone else upset. I think here, I think we kind of stayed down, not to say that you were, you know, worried about anything, but you know, there were some tweets and something. We don't need to get into all that. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. just down the middle here, just down the middle, yeah. just two old buds chatting away. You know, it was nice. Right. It's probably better. We just leave that stuff and at least leave some of those people, their own devices. They don't probably, they probably don't need any more piling on going on. Fair enough. Fair enough. Let's do our own thing. Let's do our own thing, Ariel. Just live our own life. That's right. Look at you. You're super happy. You're like in this great mood. It's all positive vibes. Yeah, until people come it. after me, you know, because I said high road Hawani no more. So like you could take uh, that see, route. I, you could take that route. I'm I'm out to slay all the haters. Well, see, no one, no one's no one no one important is really coming to me. No one that I've always been that guy. See, but I've, I, I've, see I, I wasn't gonna say that. Yeah. Because I because 
I talked Anthony, to you outside. You were of there. Other you were one of the few people that saw Hiwani in person in Houston. We don't need to. We don't need to talk about it. <laughs> we won't talk about but it. But you know, hey, yeah. I'm happy to talk about it. The problem is the person in question will go run and start crying to everyone. So we don't need to talk about it. But you, yeah. you saw. Did you yeah. not see? Did you not see Hiwani in I, person? So I got some really trusted friends. Uh, you know that I. You know they're just people I share a lot of my stuff with. I was so excited. To tell that story. The first thing I said, Ariel Hawani is a goddamn gangster. That's right. And I was so pumped about you it. You heard it right here from one of the best fighters on the planet. I repeat, Ariel Hawani is a what? Goddamn gangster. That's right. Loop that. Put that on your uh, on your ringtone. <laughs> we'll, we'll tell that story we one go. day when we're old men. We'll tell. I, yeah. When in, yeah. We'll tell it. We'll, we'll tell, tell it one day. And I was happy to experience it with you. Uh, for now, though, we'll leave it at that. Very happy for you. Good luck. Looking forward to it. September 18th, Las Vegas, Apex. Ryan Spann, he said a lot about this man. He's all fired up. Let's see if he backs it up on September 18th. Thank you, Anthony. Good luck. And uh, looking forward to seeing you in action in, uh, what, uh, 10 days from exactly today. Yeah, yeah. I'll talk to you next week. All right. Yes, sir. There he is, the one and only Anthony Lionheart Smith, one of the good guys in the game. And who, like I said, has uh, developed into quite the analyst as well. would love to see him in the booth. Tough. You know, he's right. There's a lot of good guys out there. But uh, I'm looking forward to seeing his development as not only an, al an analyst, but he's still got some fight left in him. That win over Jimmy Crute, very impressive. Had the win over Devin Clark, got back on track, and uh, then had the win over Jimmy Crute, and now here he is returning. Had that rough... You know, that rough stretch there, the loss to Rakic, the loss to Glover, had the big win over Gustafson, but now we're talking about, you know, over two years ago, the loss to Jones. It was really the Glover loss that changed everything. Uh, but now here he is, headlining, back in the mix. Looking forward to it. Um, all right, in a minute, we are going to be joined by the one and only, I hope, Patty Pimblett, who's become such a big star now. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if he's actually going to be able to... Uh, take some time out of his schedule. He's become such a big deal. Let's let's get an update on his Instagram following. Here we go, Patty the Batty. Now at 513. Earlier today, like two hours ago, he was at 509. He just gained 4,000 followers somehow in the last two hours. He was very sad about the fact that they took away his Instagram. And uh, uh, he was upset that he had 100 and something thousand followers and they took it away. And he wanted to get back. Now he's got 513,000 followers and all for good reason because he had a fantastic UFC debut, one of the best in recent memory. And like I said on Saturday, it has been a while since we had someone that we've been watching, talking about for years, four, five, six years, finally come over, finally debut after all the ups and downs, after all the buzz, after all the interviews and make an impact. It's been a while since we had someone fighting outside of the UFC that was making that kind of of an impact. That kind of a buzz. And now here he is. Finally makes his debut and looks incredible. What a fight. And he predicted it on this show. He said that he would win in the first round. And he did win in the first round. Now, uh, you know, it got a little it got a little dicey there in the uh, the early seconds of the fight, but he ended up finishing Luigi Vendramini in the very first round, and now everyone is talking about Patty the Batty. I've had more people in the last few days who, you know, are casual fans, who aren't the biggest MMA fans, who know that I do this for a living but aren't watching every single fight, come up to me and say, I love Patty the Batty. I love this guy. Where has he been? When is he going to fight again? Who's next for him? And I want to say to these people, where were you four or five years ago in the BT Sports Studios when he's throwing up against Julian Arosa? Where were you at the Echo Arena? I'm going to be that guy. 
I'm going to be that guy who talks about the band when they were playing at the dive hall and now they make it to MSG. And I say, no, 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 no. You can't, you can't claim him. You can't own him. He's ours. He's one of us. And so without further ado, let us go back to the zoo machine and say hello to the most talked about man in MMA today. The one and only Patty, the baddie. Pimlet, there he is on cloud nine. I mean, look at that face, Patty. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm here. I've filled myself up with food today already, lad. So the cheeks are back. The cheeks are back. I love it. Yes, a much different uh, uh, face than the one we saw when you were on around ten days ago. Uh, the the sunken in cheeks. But Patty, you know, I, I've. I've rarely been able to see someone actually on cloud nine. I feel like I'm talking to someone on cloud nine. You are living your best life. I mean, could you even put into words what the last you know few days have been like for you after your UFC debut? Because I just feel like you have truly exploded, my friend. Yeah, this it's went off, on it? It's went off. Big time. You say, but um said it was going to happen, didn't I? You did. I knew what was coming up. This was, this was all, all going to happen. Because I knew it was finishing in the first. People are going on about the punch out. It made me legs going up. I eat that shit. <laughs> Um, so the 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 connection isn't great right now. It's kind of cutting out, and you're you're out. you're a highly anticipated guest on the show. Uh, are you on Wi-Fi, yeah. Patty? I know you're on vacation. I feel bad even bothering you, Patty. You're taking some time oh, out of your actual vacation for us. I just do stop better. Let's see. Are you on Wi-Fi right now? No, there is no Wi-Fi. There isn't even a tell here. <laughs> I'm, I'm in a converted ship and container. Is that true? A converted shipping container? Yeah. Where are yeah. you? You're on a hammock, in I Cornwall. see. I don't know in where Cornwall. In Cornwall, it's the opposite end of the country, but okay. six and a half hours drive from Liverpool. Are you on, are you on holiday? Uh, yeah, on a, on a little trip away. Okay, I love it. Well, it's well-deserved. Uh, we'll fight through this. It's okay. I mean, again, I'm very thankful that you're on the show. Uh, so, so you were saying, just because you cut out there briefly, that punch didn't hurt you? You, you weren't rocked at all? No, that was not. not <laughs> I've been it with bigger shots than that before. Lad. But uh, when I watched it back, the, the sound of it was boss. It sounded great. The noise sounded like he did it. We were the proper big shots. But as I say, I'd take them any day of the week. What about the days leading up to the fight, Patty? You were so confident. You talked a big game. You said you would finish him in the first round, all that stuff. We've been talking about your UFC debut for what feels like five, six, seven years. Were you a little more nervous than you were letting on? No, oh, that's no oh, it's like I knew in my head it was a foregone conclusion. But then I'll be honest with it, with it being no crab, like that one shot, everyone just thought he was winning the round for some reason. See how many punches and kicks I hit him with? My ankles are proper fat lap because I kicked him in the head that many times. Um, but I heard, I heard DC or someone say he's losing this round and I knew they were talking about me. So I just thought, am I? Yeah. And I just like, put my foot on the gas a bit more. Um, and so you get the win and you get the finish and then everything comes uh, afterwards. Have you been surprised by the reaction? By by the the pandemonium surround. I mean, this is like the Beatles. You're the fifth Beatles, so it all makes sense. Back in 1960 something, it's been amazing. It, it's been a long time since someone has kind of burst onto the UFC like this. Are you surprised by any of this, or again, did you expect all of this? The the byproduct of it all. Expecting all this, yeah. Expecting all this to be honest. I told you last week that this new account will be on the part of all this happening. This. Are you lamenting the fact that you that you should really be having seven hundred and fifty thousand followers now, not five hundred thousand? No, followers. some of them, some of them are re followers again. I think so. It wouldn't be that many more. It would be a good fifty or so more. But new account lads flying, absolutely flying. Got more followers than most of the UFC fighters. It's incredible. Only had one fight. Uh, who's who's the coolest person that reached out to you? That is there a message that you got from someone to wish you congratulations? Hey, I, I saw like was there someone that like wow? I can't believe I'm getting a message from this person. Yeah, there's a there's a few that there's a few on me messages. 
I got <laughs> what, well, I got a, I got a public tweet last night off Danny Sturridge, someone who used to play for Liverpool, which was nice. Amazing. Um, now, what have you? You know, we were talking to Molly earlier, and she was talking about you know lessons learned from when you won the Cage Warriors title for the first time. What did you learn that you're hoping to not do the same thing? You know, maybe not get too big of a head. Maybe not. You know, is there something that you learned from that title victory that you want to apply to this debut and everything that's coming now? Yeah, all of that. But like, that's what I mean because I learned them lessons then. That's why I'm glad that they learn them lessons then, because I know I won't do the same again now. It's that simple. Because of what I've done back then, and went the way I went back then, it won't happen again this time, because I've already been there, done that. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to come back in the gym Monday, lad, training every day as usual. How many calories do you think you've consumed since Saturday? <laughs> I don't want to go there. <laughs> How much? I swear to God, I don't know. I reckon I'm eating around 10,000 a day, easy. Really? Easy. Jeez, it looks like you're in a food coma right now, if I'm being honest. <laughs> I am. I am. I've just had to have an half an hour nap, lad. Yeah. Before we come on. Yeah. Because uh, I, I went for a bit. I'll, I'll, have to, I'll send you the video on what's happened in a minute of the food. Uh, the dog was sitting in there with us. I, I end up eating my burger. My bird's half of my bird burger because she never ate it. Most of the halloumi fries, and there was two portions of fries, and I got a milkshake to finish off, lad. Oh, my gosh. You want to see the dessert I've got here, though, lad? I've got a cookie pie. That's going to go in in a minute. <laughs> How much do you think you weigh right now? Oh, I'm, a, I'm easy 85 now, like, so like 185, 186. My gosh. Is this easy. common for you, that you, you always go a little bit crazy with the food the week after? Yeah, I'm terrible with food. Like on Saturday, I got we got a big Popeyes between us, and then I got a Shake Shack with Graham, and then I got a Dairy Queen about two hours later. <laughs> that is amazing. You're even on the Patrick McAfee show yesterday. Do you even know who that guy is? Yeah, I don't know who he is. Like, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's it's a big podcast, isn't it? Yeah, not as big as this one, if I'm being honest, Patty. No, not for, for MMA. Yeah. Definitely not. Yeah. He kind of licks my boots, if I'm being honest, Patty. I mean, he can't <laughs> even hold a candle to me. Um, but it's just so, like, how do you, honest question, if you can answer honestly, how do you not, or maybe you don't want to, how do you not, this is crazy to see for us who have been watching you for so long, to see all these people talking about you, how do you not, like, get drunk off of all of this excitement? Or do you want to get drunk for now off of all of it? Because yeah, let's be honest, you got a lot more to do, right? You don't just want to be the guy who won one fight in the UFC and then fizzled off. So how do you allow yourself to yeah. stay level-headed? Because I've been there before. When I won that case, what do you spell that? People talking about me. It was the next big thing. And I've had to have setbacks and realize stuff before when, I've, when my head's got too big. So... I know it's never going to happen again, lad, because I've been there and done that when I was a kid. Mm. What I about going a ten fight with Steve now, and it wouldn't do that. Okay, great. What about that week leading up to the uh, the fight? In retrospect, how stressful was it with the visa and all this stuff? Well, it was stressful, like just the fact that, like, I knew it was I was getting it because they said on the Friday, "Oh, it's being sent," but then we had a bank holiday in England, so I couldn't get it back till Tuesday morning. And then obviously I got it back on my flight and stuff. And I didn't get to the hotel till Tuesday night. So lad, as you can see, me my sleeping pattern's still cabbage up. Mm-hmm. I'm still like that last night I fell asleep at like nine PM at our time, yeah. And woke up at like eight AM. Because yesterday I was up again at five thirty to come to Cornwall. And the day before I was still travelling. <laughs> wow. A bit of a whirlwind, right? Yeah, I never even got to see Las Vegas, me that. You never even left like all the was, Yeah, all I seen was the hotel, the PI and Whole Foods. Was it was that your first time in Vegas? Yeah. Wow. That your first time in Vegas, you never even went on the strip. Yeah, exactly. So I need another fight there. Would you like to fight again there or are you hoping that the next one is in Europe? Yeah, I'm hoping the next one's in England. <laughs> Not Europe, but England. What have they told you? Oh, I haven't been told nothing, yeah. I'm expecting to be a guest fighter or something somewhere first. Yeah. Just be like that. Yeah. 
just revel in it, right? Just be the guy who shows up, yeah. is eating, not cutting weight, but you're able to revel in all the, like the love. Getting stuff, getting stuff paid for me, getting all food. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a bit of me earlier. Yeah. Um, would you like to fight again in 2020? 2021, excuse Oh, me. yeah. Yeah, I'll be fighting again, 2021, definitely. When are you thinking? November, December? November, late November, early December. That's good with me. I kind of feel like they need to put you on this Madison Square Garden card as well. What date's that? Uh, November 6th. I've heard the, um, the tracks are heavy in New York, though. They are, they are, they are heavy, yes, that's right. <laughs> but it's enough in Vegas for me that to make me nearly spew up, so I'm good to New York. Okay. I nearly vomited the other day when I saw what I was getting taxed. A lot. So, as you know, a lot of people want to fight you. Has one kind of stuck out that interests you, or you don't care? I don't care, lads. <laughs> people can talk about the only one. That, that, that thing. Everyone wants to talk about me. It's amazing. I'll leave my name out, lad. They don't mean, I don't need to mention anybody's name. Yeah, yeah. I I'm on there. I remember a few years ago you took that picture with uh, with Graham, um, Graham Boylan. It was the one with the odds. What was it? Were you uh, beating Conor McGregor? It was like 50 to 1 or something like that, or 5 to 1? Yeah, like, yeah, it was like um, we got given that. I think that was our party power. We got given that as like a, a promotional thing. But we, never, we never put that bet on. We got given it. You didn't do it? No, we never put it on. They just give us it. Oh, okay. Is that still a thing? Is that still live? No, I think it was by 2020 or something like that. Ah. Does it kind of feel like that could be one of the biggest fights they put on? Yeah, it could be, obviously. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's bums on seats, that makes an eyes on pay-per-views. Yeah. But obviously, I'm, I'm not delusional. I'm miles away from that at the minute. Mm -hmm. I've got a lot of fights to win first, and I'm going to do that. In your mind... I'll win another fight. Hopefully, get a new belt or contract, and then start beating more fields up. Yeah. But for now, I'm coming for the bonus every single fight. In your mind, how far are you away from being in those big fights? I don't know. That just depends how, uh, how they want to do it with me. Lad. I don't mind. Mm -hmm. Did you talk to the brass afterwards? I'm sure they were very happy. Um, no, because you get, you get ushered through. You know what I mean? Into all your press stuff and that. But I was getting escorted by someone. I think his name was Jeff. Okay. I don't know. I'm not too sure. <laughs> and then some, someone else said, oh, we're getting escorted by such and such. I mean, you're important. It's like, does it? Yes. I don't know. <laughs> He's no the boy is. Wait, but you, no, no, no conversation with the brass? No handshake? No nothing? No welcome to the UFC? Uh, Dana wasn't there, was he? Uh, he wasn't even at the fight. No. Nah. Was that a bummer? Uh, no, I know Hunter was there. Right. He spoke to Graham, and I'd show and Shelby shook me hand and stuff and said congratulations. Would you say that was the I best? Said, I told you what was coming. That's right. I That's told right. you. <laughs> uh, you. You have had some big nights in your career. Uh, that was a unique one because it was essentially in an empty arena. Would you say, though, best night of your career thus far, that night? No. Winning that belt in the echo, lad. That, uh, that, that'll take some beating. You know what I mean? Really? Wow. That is amazing to say that winning the Cage Warriors title was bigger than your UFC debut. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't even jump on the cage, lad. I would have got filled out if fight this. They said that to you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about that Michael Bisping afterwards? You're like, oh, wow, well, look at me. And he's like, well, you got rocked. I mean, come on, Mike. Why do you got to be such a negative Nancy, right? Did you notice that? Nah, that's just that's just a man killing him. That lad having a little joke. I know. Can't help himself. I know. But um, I, it, it really it genuinely did not hurt me at all. It was just my own fault. I should have rolled before I threw that shot, and I never rolled. I noticed straight away after I watched the pass, what I done wrong. Because you were talking so I'm much, just, I'm, not, I'm more disappointed that he he landed the takedown after it. Really? Yeah. Why are you more disappointed in that? Because I shouldn't have got sucked down like that. Mm -hmm. I don't mind taking a punch or two, lad. As I say, it wakes me up. Mm -hmm. Oh, getting sucked down like that, that pissed me off a bit. I like the fact that I wrestled up single leg and then don't got up. Like, showed that even when he had caught me with his biggest shot, my wits are still there to just 
easily get up. But I'm disappointed at the fact that he actually took me down. I'm all in one for takedowns in the UFC. <laughs> Defense, shite. <laughs> Even though my significant strikes was a 58% fucking which is good fucking take down defense was tight man uh, could you hear Molly uh, cheering you on um, I could towards the end what does she what does she mean to you because like I said earlier uh, your your relationship is one of my favorite things in the sport what what does she represent to you just as I say I always say she's like my big sister lad in the gym she's just always always been there or there about aren't she um, you guys just have a great relationship. It was so great to see how happy she was for you, how genuinely happy. You know, you don't see that often. It was just such a great moment. And your post fighting, you walking out, how you like me now. I mean, the whole thing. I'm trying to think of better. There, there, there have been obviously some great debuts, no doubt about it. I'm not saying it's the best, but it's been a long time since we had someone make that kind of an impact in their debut, especially someone that we've been talking about and waiting for for quite some time. Your old friend Julian Arosa was on the card as well. Uh, PT. Oh, lad, I, don't know. I thought I thought he deserved a performance bonus, you know. Yeah, that was a good performance. That lad, I thought he deserved one. I thought that was half like. Would you like to run that one back? Dana, Dana was Dana was happy though. He um he get, he sent us some harlot to harlot to the uh, to the hotel. Nice, a few big bottles <laughs> and a few uh, t shirts after me, Jack and Molly. Uh, would you like to run that one back? With Julian, do you care? Yeah. I, don't, I don't. I don't really care to be honest. You're non plus. If he wants to, as I say, I'm not calling anyone out. Lad. I don't need to. Mm -hmm. We were in the same corner the other day, lad, chatting and that. But we'll we'll see what the future holds. Lad. I don't mind. We'll see. Big sponsors coming. Whoever's name, names on the contract next, lad, I'm fighting. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. And um, big sponsors need to message Graham. Let Graham know. Intensity fight management. Get on. I would imagine people are knocking on the door. Yeah, they are. A few people have been on to the sort sponsors and stuff. But um, we still need more. So Yeah. Let's go. Come on. How many times have you watched it? I've only got to watch the whole thing once. Come on. I came down here. Really? I've, I've, seen, I've seen it on stories and that, the, the finish. But I haven't been able to watch the full fight back. I've only been able to watch it once. And what was it like when you came home for the brief period, your homecoming? Did you have a lot of people waiting for you? <laughs> no, not like that. Come on. Went to see me, went, went to see me mum and that and my sister. And um, a few people got on me in the pub in Cornwall last night, to be honest. Lad, and half hours waiting for <laughs> And a few people today. So people are starting to, I mean, you're a hard guy to miss, right? So I'm assuming life is about to change for you. Yeah, it is. Me, me missus is an happy. Oh, God. Now she has to share you with everyone. Yeah. Molly said she's going to be the one who will keep you from having the big head. Yeah, she can. She can do that. <laughs> well, um, I will leave you to your vacation, Patty. It's, uh, it's a great thing to see you come to the UFC finally after all these years and then have a debut like that. Really genuinely happy for you, my man. And uh, I hope that you enjoy this and are able to enjoy it. And no more, you know, chatting with the uh, the trolls on Twitter. It's amazing. You went from beating all the trolls on Twitter to then beating Luigi Vendramini in a UFC cage. But now you're above it all. You're better than it all. You yeah. don't need that, right? They're not going to bring you down. I don't need that sort of negativity in my life, lad. I'll leave my followers to, to do what they're doing. That's right. Uh, so enjoy it. And I really appreciate you making some time for us on your vacation. Uh, that means a lot. So thank you very much. No, it's all good, fella. I'm just glad the signal went better when I sat by the door. It did. Yeah, yes. look, this is if I flip it around, this is me little garden. Wow, look at that. That is beautiful. Chill one. Uh, there isn't even a television in here, lad. That's good. That's good. You got that little hammock? No, I'm never off my phone. Blow the roof off that gaff, Patty. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy, my friend. We'll talk to you soon. All the best. Thank you very much. All right, there he is. The one and only Patty, the baddie Pimblet. Everyone talking about him. Look like he uh, was enjoying himself. Felt bad bothering him. Having a little nap, a little sleep, a little vacation, a little holiday as... Uh, my good friend Alistair Overeem likes to say, but uh, what a debut. I was trying to think of this. Oh, you know, like 
guys like Justin Gaethje had big debuts. Um, Michael Chandler had a big debut, but they were coming from other organizations where you were seeing them on, you know, cable TV and whatnot. There were, you know, even Hamza, you know, the hardest of the hardcore we're talking about him, but it felt like we were, we were talking about him more after the fact than before the fact. Patty, if there are a few names thrown out, but like, you know, Connor was one of those that we were talking about a lot in the, the months leading up to it. And there's a lot of similarities between him and Connor, of course, because the cage warriors and all that now in the same way, class 155. So maybe that would happen. Obviously, as he said, miles away. But it, it, it feels like it's been a while because of how many fighters are on the roster and um, how many shows there are where there's a fighter that you watch for a very long time, multiple years, climb the ranks, even have some setbacks, and then finally debut in the UFC. This was a very, very unique one and a really cool story. So very happy for Patty Pimblett. And uh, cool to see everyone talking about him and uh, celebrating his big UFC debut. Now, in a matter of moments, uh, we're going to be joined by another guy who is hoping to have a big UFC debut on November 6th, Madison Square Garden, New York City. Ian Gary is a name that a lot of people have been talking about in Europe and specifically in Ireland as a name to watch as potentially the next big star to come out of Ireland. I, I talked about over the weekend that, you know, Irish MMA kind of hit. There was, there was a period there where it seemed like everyone was coming out of Ireland. SPG Ireland, of course, being that, you know, top gym team Rhino. Um, there's a bunch of, you know, uh, Chris Fields doing great things over there. And then they hit a bit of a rough patch, but now it seems like they're doing uh, big things again. And obviously James Gallagher coming back. Uh, and Ian Gary is a name that a lot of people are excited about. So he's a former uh, Cage Warriors welterweight champion, won the belt back in June, the vacant welterweight title. And it was just announced this morning that he will be fighting Jordan Williams in his UFC debut on that UFC 268 card at Madison Square Garden in New York City. So what a spot to debut a name. They're very high on him. And, you know, worth noting, uh, Jordan Williams, you know, a guy who I think off the top of my head, let me double check here. I think he's lost his last two in a row. My internet's really slow. But, you know, some of those other Cage Warriors guys who haven't had the best debuts, um, you know, they've been given, you know, Reese McKee got Hamza Chemaev in his, in his debut. Let me see. Uh, yeah, he's lost his last two in a row, coming off a, a rear naked choke loss to Mickey Gall uh, back in July. So, you know, those other guys had some tough uh, debuts. Ian Gary, I think, getting a, a proper debut on a big stage and a big opportunity for him, um, you know, to live up to all that hype and to get people excited. Good to have this uh, influx of young talent. And then after that, I'll answer some of the questions. Again, arielhalwani.substack.com is where you can leave some of those questions. How many we got here? Oh, we got a few, uh, 35. So... I'll roll through those. I wonder if there are any AEW questions. A lot of people excited about AEW All Out and professional wrestling. Professional wrestling, hotter than ever right now. Well, maybe not ever, but definitely hotter than it's been in the last 20 years, if you ask me. Um, it's just been an amazing time for pro wrestling with AEW and uh, WWE doing its thing. Uh, I I'm going to be at SmackDown on Friday at Madison Square Garden with my boys. I'm very excited about that, but that AEW... Uh, pay-per-view was great on Sunday. I watched the majority of it. In-ring debut of CM Punk, Brian Danielson, Adam Cole. I love it. And I wish, as I've said before, I wish that there was a number two promotion in MMA um, that garnered the kind of passion and excitement that AEW does. Like we, I mean, I don't care what anyone says. It's Pro wrestling is hotter right now than MMA. There's no doubt about that. Now, of course, there's going to be moments where, you know, Connor's fighting this and that, and people are talking about MMA. But right now, pro wrestling is hotter. They're getting over a million viewers. AEW is the number two promotion every week. Um, WWE is doing their thing, and they're creating competition. And, you know, the performers are getting paid more as a result of that. And people are excited about this guy coming here and going there and who's going to debut. Like, that's exciting. And obviously, it's impossible to recreate that kind of excitement because you can't have people showing up on every single show in MMA, but we need to get that oomph, 
You need to get that excitement, that passion. 15,000 people at a major arena for the quote-unquote number two. We need that oomph. We need that big event feel. Um, And sometimes less is more. Sometimes just having less events. I don't know. All I'm saying is I don't know how you can deny, and I know MMA fans get all worked up over this sort of thing, how you can deny the fact that right now pro wrestling is hotter than mixed martial arts. Lots to be excited about in MMA. Don't get me wrong. I'm not hating on it, but damn, is pro wrestling hot right now with AEW doing its thing. So uh, that was a fun pay-per-view. If anyone wants to ask me about that, go ahead. I can uh, dig a little deeper. And by the way, before we get to our last guest of the day, the aforementioned Ian Gary, I do want to uh, welcome another member to the team. We've just added the great Connor Burks, who uh, spells his name C-O-N-N-E-R, which is somewhat ironic because uh, everyone misspells Connor McGregor's name that way. I, I did want to welcome him. He uh, just joined us officially, I guess, today, maybe not today, maybe a couple of days ago, but first show uh, as him, uh, you know, with him being a part of the team. And uh, the team is really coming together. It's great to have everyone on board on that side of the wall over there. Someone was asking me recently, like, who are you talking to? There's no one in this room with me, but I like to pretend that, like I'm talking to the team over there on the other side of the wall. Um, anyway, great to have him. A uh, big MMA fan, knows a lot about the world of gambling. And so you'll be hearing from Connor in the coming shows and weeks. Um, and I'm looking forward to that very much. So welcome to the team. Connor, for now, though, let us go to the Zoom machine and say hello to our final guest of the day. It has been a while since I have wanted to talk to this man. And finally, we get to welcome Ian Gary to the program. There he is, smiling ah. Ian Gary himself. How are you, sir? How are we? How are you, Ariel? It's a pleasure. Uh, it is a pleasure. It is my pleasure, my friend. And like I said, I've been wanting to talk to you for quite some time. I was waiting for the day your UFC debut got announced to have you on the show. And wouldn't you know it, the stars have aligned for us, my friend. Congratulations, Ian. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's exciting. Um, it's been a while, obviously. It's way back when, since we've been in contact since that video of um, my Imagine Tattoo came out. But you've been there. Every time I fought, you've been hyping me up, you've been hyping me up, and here we are. I need you to do it again now. I, I Show will. Show everybody, tell everybody what we're about, because it's going to be the exact same. I will. I will. No doubt about it. Um, and yes, I'm happy that you mentioned that, because yes, I haven't had you on the show, but I do make a point every time you fight to watch your fights, to talk about you, because there's something special about you. It's funny that you mentioned that video, because that was kind of the first time that um, you know you were on the radar I went back and watched it last night. For those that missed it, and I should have played it beforehand, it's it's you in your car, and you talk about your grandfather who uh, has dementia, and every time you'd yep. say the word imagine, he would start singing the song by the great, the late great John Lennon, Imagine All the People. Yep. It's a beautiful video. I think it has 1.5 million views on Twitter right now. It went viral. It's a crazy thing. How is your grandfather doing? Great, great. So, um He's just, obviously with dementia, it gets progressively worse as time goes on. So unfortunately, he was uh, moved into a home because it, it gets hard on family and everyone's trying to look after him. So he's in a home, but he's great. He's in, he's in high hopes and he's, he's enjoying his life and that's all that matters. And obviously, it's a horrible um, issue, the fact that he goes through that and he loses his memory. But he's good. He's happy. That's all that matters at the end of the day. But he still knows all the words. So, so Amazing. he's good. So when, when, if, you, like, if you were in his presence today... And you said the word imagine. He would still sing it? Oh, yeah. That, imagine and Devil Woman. He'd sing them. That's yeah, he nice. has his little, his little dance that he does. And he just kind of, Devil Woman. He loves That's it. He likes it. They're just his favorite songs, yeah. So now he's everything's well. Is that a common thing for people who have dementia? Um, I, I'm not sure. I have. I remember when that video went viral that people said, oh, people said, come to the belt. Oh, my granddad or my nana or my mother had this. And they had little tweaks. Um, that they kind of remembered, um, but I don't know, I'm not really too too sure. Enough, but all I know is that he knows all the words to that song. And for someone who calls me the big fella and doesn't even know my name anymore, it's quite nice to see. That is incredible. Um, if you look back at that video, um, and, and you're you're a fresh. I mean, I think it was like three four years ago. Now you're a young kid, right? What, what, when was that? Three years? Two years ago. Two was and it half? two? Okay, so three. So there's less yeah. than two and a half. Who, who was that? What's the difference between that Ian Gary and the Ian Gary on my show right now? Good question, Aaron. That was a good question. More mature. 
smarter, better in every way. Do you know what I mean? I've changed. Like I've slowly started to change into the person that I want to be and the person, the man that I want to become. And I'm changing my life because I have goals and aspirations that I want to achieve. And we're elite athletes and I want to put my head down. I've got a certain amount of time. Like, you know, there's like, like baseball where we're here and we can play for years. It's like, I've got my head down on go, 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 go. So obviously that's my main focus, but I'm happy. I'm determined and I'm doing everything my way, the way I want to do. There's a ton of um, excitement surrounding you, buzz, hype, whatever you want to say. And you know, you, you yeah. it's impossible to, um, Avoid it, ignore it. The the Connor, you know, connection, Ireland, yeah. the next big thing from Ireland, the first big thing since Connor, all that stuff. At any point, does it get to be a lot? Does it get to be too much? Do you not want to be compared to him? Do you not want to be talked about in the same sentence as him? Do I not want to be compared to one of the biggest sports stars of all time? Of course, I'll, I like the comparison. Of course, I, obviously being Irish, obviously being from obviously having the talk walking the walk there's a lot of similarities but of course I want it it's like any high school basketball or college basketball or being compared to Michael Jordan of course it's a great comparison I mean Connor changed the game in MMA like he brought so many eyes to the sport if I can do something similar then that's a win mm -hmm. I like I want to be he, he's he was the reason I'm in MMA do you know what I mean his his um rising was the reason that MMA got huge in, in Dublin and Ireland. It's the reason I walked into an MMA gym. And if I can, if I can bring eyes to this, to the UFC and I can put people in gyms because they want to be like me or they want to, they want to do it because they see me enjoy it and, and putting on a show, then amazing. That's a win. Like it's, it's, it's all you can ever ask for. So that it, it is amazing to me to start to meet people who are a byproduct of his success. Cause in my head, he's yeah. still a very young guy. So you watched him. You watched him fight one day and said, I want to do this. You had no prior martial arts background? No, I had prior martial arts background. Um, I boxed when I was a kid. I had I done judo when I grew up. And I always knew I wanted to go into MMA. Um, I remember the first time I met Connor once and only once. Um, I was working in uh, Louis Copeland's shoe shop that he used to buy suits before. Um, yeah. Before he got really, really big and started working with August McGregor. He... Um, he came in one day and I was like, oh, I'd love to do MMA. He's like, come down to the gym. Um, but yeah, he, like his, his success, his rising was the reason I'm here. And I hope to do that one day for some other kid. Did you take him up on his offer? Did you go to the gym? No, that was when I was about 16. I didn't start until I was about 18, 19. Why did you, why, he's so, got yeah. Conor McGregor saying, come to the gym. Why did you go to the gym? <laughs> I was 16 and I was at home playing PlayStation. You know what I, mean? <laughs> I was, I was in school. I was playing PlayStation. I had to be up at eight, seven o'clock in the morning. My mom would drop me to school. I'd go home. I do my homework. I wouldn't get in trouble the next day in school. I do the same thing. I didn't really have a choice. <laughs> wow. That is amazing. Um, I was, I was flat out in judo at the time. I got, and, and I was working to get my black belt. And then after I got my black belt and I finished, I finished, uh, school, I was like, right, I'm going to go join MMA. Amazing. Um, and did you go by, by any chance? Did you go to any of those events, those UFC events that he was a part of or the one afterwards in Dublin? No. So, Ariel, I have never been to a live UFC. Wow. So I'm going to save it <laughs> and I'm going to watch UFC 268 live. That is going to be incredible. experience of a live event. Was that a thing? Like, did you not want to go to an event until you were fighting on it? No, it was never a thing. It's just, just, just the way it worked. I've been to small little regional shows and cage warriors and stuff like that, but I've never, I've never been to a UFC event. So the fact that it's good, I'm going to be in Madison Square Garden, I'm going to be fighting on the card, and I'm going to sit back and I'm going to enjoy watching everyone else try to be my performance. It's going to be like, all right, let's see how this goes. When did you start to realize I'm really, really good at this? The second I walked into the gym, really, and I said to my my coach at the time, I said, "I want to fight," and that's it. I, I, I'm always in any sport I do, I'm going to be good at. It's I'm an athlete, I'm a competitor. I have that drive. I have that. Comp if I play like like a sport with anyone and and they beat me, I'm like, "Let's go again." Like we, I have to win. I want to win. I, it doesn't matter what it is. If it's chess, ping pong. If it's MMA, if it's fishing, whatever it is that anyone's doing, 
want to be better than the other person doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, I just have that that competitor inside me that wants to be the best. Um, so yeah, no, it's the the second I I walked into the gym and I knew I could be I could be one of the best to ever do. It. Why do you think you know? I remember first fight in Cage Warriors, second fight. Everyone's talking about you. You know, I follow a lot of those uh, Irish MMA media members. They do a great mm-hmm. job and they pinpoint the talent at a very young age. You know, the guys Sean and Pizzi and yeah. all the guys, and they all talk you up. So of course, when they're talking about you. I'm I'm watching Niall, everyone. I don't yeah. want to miss uh, miss anyone, but you know all the characters. And so they're yeah. talking about you. I'm watching you. Why do you think from such an early age people were talking about you from your first, second fight? Because that doesn't happen very often. Why do you think you were pinpointed as one of those guys to watch? I think it's evident that I can talk to talk and I can walk to walk. I mean, you started watching me on my second pro fight. You don't watch everybody's second profile. You don't follow everyone's career. There's a reason. I'm, I'm interested. Do you know what I mean? I talk to talk. I walk to walk. I back it up. I, my fights are fun. They're energetic. When I get on the mic, it's the same. I, I, I speak the truth and I, and I have fun. That's the most important thing is no matter what I do, I have fun. When I'm on the mic, when I'm in the gym, when I'm in the fight, I have the time of my life. It's what I love to do. So I think that just that positive energy and that, that, good vibe that I bring is is infectious and I think that goes throughout life it's like if I'm having dinner with my family or friends it's like that positive energy is spread it's just it's what I it's what I enjoy I, I always want people there if me and you are doing I could be sitting here and being boring or I could sit here and try to bring a smile to your face and make you have a good day and leave and go that kid's pretty cool do you know what I mean I like this kid right you could be leaving going he's a prick I don't want to do interview him again do you know what I mean it's like there's two ways you can do it you can have a, a good a good attitude or you can just moan all day. And I'm not a moaner. I just go in and I put the hard work in and I fight my ass off. So you make it to 7-0. and You win in June. You win the vacant uh, Cage Warriors welterweight title. Did you know, like, were you told beforehand you win this fight, you're getting a UFC deal? Did you know beforehand? No. No, I didn't know that I was getting a UFC deal. No, I I assumed that, like, there might have potentially been been talks or whatever. But, um I knew it. There was a lot of interviews. Everyone was asking. I knew they were watching me. Do you know what I mean? I knew everybody was watching me. Um, so yeah, I just went in there, put on a performance that uh, showed off my my personality, and here we are, ready to make that debut. And and so I have to ask. There was a lot of drama surrounding that uh, last fight. Uh, you were a part of Team KF for quite some time. You were one of their homegrown guys, and uh, it seemed like wow, like you're rising they're rising as a gym in the irish mma scene chris field's doing a great job the whole team doing a great job and then all of a sudden the week of the fight we find out you're not with them anymore um and you talked about it a little bit afterwards what the heck happened ian why did it all go wrong it seemed like you guys were such a great team where did it all go wrong oh that's you know what that's a good question ariel that's a good question i i still don't fully understand um it's it's all a mess um, it was abrupt, but not a surprise. Um, my former coach has his own personal issues and they're his. But at the end of the day, when it happened, like I was a bit taken back by it because obviously I'm 10 days out from my world title fight, the biggest fight of my career. And I'm sitting there and I get a text and I'm like, oh, all right. Okay. Um, and my brain was just like, I've got a world title fight. I, I can't deal with anything else. I have to just focus on my main goal, which was to win the world title, because at the end of the day, there's people that's going to come in and out of your life, Eric. Do you know what I mean? Whether it be good, bad, friends, family, loved ones, whatever it is. And you've just got to keep doing it. You've got to keep going forward. No matter how hard it might be, you've just got to keep going forward. And I just put my head down. I showed up. I won a world title on my own, walked out on my own to a world title fight with no team. I had to ask a friend of mine, Paul Hughes, to be in my corner because they were going to pull the fight if I didn't have anyone in my corner because I wanted no one there. I was like, I don't need anyone. If I can stand, if I can get into that cage, I'm going to win the fight. And I had to ask somebody at the back for pads. They had no one to warm me up. So I just put my head down, Ariel, and I went and I just, I went out and look at where we are now. Like li- literally, I'm in Sanford MMA. So it's a blessing in disguise because I've went out there. I won my world title. I got my UFC contract. I'm now fighting my UFC debut on the biggest card of the year at Madison Square Garden. How many people do you know that have had their debut at Madison Square Garden? I'm 23. I've signed for UFC. 
and I'm making my debut at MSG. Oh, it's incredible. And I'm in Stanford MMA, yeah. one of the best gyms on the planet, surrounded by elite world-class talent. Uh, and, and I want to get to how you got to Stanford, but how do you not crumble under that kind of pressure? You don't have a team, you don't have pads, you don't have a corner, uh, biggest fight of your life, potential UFC contract on the line. That's a lot for a 23-year-old to deal with. And by the way, I think you were injured too, right? Wasn't your knee all messed up as well? Yes, yes. I had a, um, a torn PCL. Uh, I didn't train for four and a half, five weeks. Which was, that was, that was the worst part about it all. It was when, when it happened, I was like, oh my, here we go. It's like, this is just, it's adversity arrow. We push through, we fight through adversity. Like I'm a fighter in and out of the cage and I'm a competitor. And I wouldn't be proud of myself if I was to pull out that fight. I mean, there was times where my brain went there, do you know what I mean? But I'm surrounded by, by people that push me and know that I want to do this and this is what I love. And, and, and they talk to me and they push me through. They're like, you've, you've got this. And I showed up. That's all I ever need to do. If something like that was to ever happen again, I'll show up and I'll do my job because at the end of the day, Ariel, it's my dream. It's my legacy. It's my life. And I'm not going to let anybody else stand in the way of me and what I want to do in life. Mm. When, when the fight was over, the dust settled, was there an attempt to clear the air, to patch things up, or was it done? No. There was, there was nothing. Okay. Does that bum you I out? I went home. I see. I, I, I mean, again. I know. Messing in the sky, Ariel. <laughs> no, I know. I, know. I don't know. I don't know the 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 deep levels of the relationship. But like, were you hurt by it? Were you know? And and I don't have them on the show as well. But this was big news, right? Because you're such a big prospect coming yeah. out of there, and they're a growing team. And so I'm just what like, did you feel betrayed? Did you feel some kind of way about it that that you maybe thought like, what, what, how did this all go wrong? Maybe we should try to fix this or. Maybe you just wanted nothing to do with them. So uh, obviously it was a like it was abrupt and it was ten days out of my fight, so it was like holy shit! All right, okay, um, this is just fucking happened. <laughs> but I honestly, I, I really didn't. I I didn't spend any 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 time or effort to to, to dwell on it and think about it. I had one one goal in mind, and that was to win the title because I know it's my life, my career, and if I was to exhaust any energy on that on that topic it, it would take away from my mindset and my fighting life is going to throw challenges at you ariel and this isn't just for me this is for everybody this is everybody is going to have points in their life where things don't go right and and it, it's the kind of the path isn't lining up perfectly for them and it's all well and good to be sitting there when life's going great and you're oh, happy days everything's everything's perfect but when it's not, you've still got to have that attitude that it is. It's going to work itself out. And it, the only way you can have, it can work yourself out is if you make it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? If you sit back and go, oh, that's it. I'm done. I'm never going to. I can't do this without anybody else. You're not going to get there. You need to put your head down, work your ass off, and make it. Make it yourself. Have that path. Pay that path to yourself. And that's what I did. I just focused on what I needed to do. And I, I mean, I showed up and I won a world title. And so how did you end up at Sanford? Because uh, I would imagine you had the pick of the litter. You could have gone yeah. a million different places. You go to Florida. You don't stay in yeah. Europe. You go to Sanford. As you said, an incredible team. Henry Hoof, the whole squad is tremendous. How'd you end up there? So, Ariel, if you look on Tapology and you just look at the names, the list of fighters here, especially when you look at my weight division, welterweight, it is completely stacked. I mean, just off the top of my head, right? Like you've just, you've got Gilbert Burns and Vincente Luque, two top five welterweights in the UFC. Why wouldn't I want to come somewhere where that just that amazing talent? Like I know I'm young, I can learn off these guys. Mm -hmm. Like I'm sitting, I'm on the mats rolling, looking around at the talent on the mats, and it's it's just baffling the, the people that are on the mats. So obviously, yes, of course I have to pick it a litter, but I want to go somewhere where I can see there's elite level fighters. There's elite level coaches, you know, I mean, Henry Hoof, Greg Jones, there's so many more. Like if, if I try and name them all, the list will go on. But I felt like when you looked at the list of welterweights, middleweights and lightweights in this gym, like last week I was, I was sparring, I, we were doing sparring and I was playing Southpaw for Derek Bunsen out of his fight with Till and he'd done the exact same fucking thing that he did to Till uh -huh. to me on the mats. He took me down and he smashed me, do you know what I mean? So like when you look at that, he goes in and fights in the UFC main event. 
then you've got, again, Michael Changer, who's fighting the same night as me against Justin Gaethje. It's like, why wouldn't I want to be surrounded by the elite of the elite? That's how people grow, is you test yourself day in, day out against the best in the world, and you either get chewed up and spit out, or you grow and evolve. And I'm absolutely not going to be one that's going to get spat out. Did you consider staying closer to home, Europe, somewhere nearby, so that you wouldn't be so far away? No. No, I, I, I want the best. And for me, I felt like this was the best. And since I've been here, I've, I've, I've had nothing else but the best training, the best. Like, the people here are amazing. The coaches are amazing. And there's so much for me to learn. There's so much knowledge that I can, I can soak up, and I'm just going to be like a sponge. What was your reaction when you got the UFC contract? I was sat in an airport in a wheelchair um, when I got um, when I got an email, and I was sat there and I was had a coffee, and I got an email saying, um, "What's the best email for your UC contract to be sent to?" And I was just sat there in a wheelchair, and I just kind of put my heart on my heart. Less than twenty four hours after my world title fight. And I was with my fiance and a cameraman, and we were sat there in the airport, and I kind of just went. Yes, and I was just kind of sit there, both my like my legs were bits. I was sore, my because my PCL was still killing me, um, and I was just sat there, and I was just it was kind of it, it took my breath away because it's like all that hard work, all that adversity that I fought through, and it's like I won, I showed up, I won the belt, and now I've got that UFC contract. I am the fucking best there. And I'm going to continue this in the UFC. People are going to see it. Do you know what I mean? They're going to say, oh, this guy's all hype. Every single time I fight Ariel, people are going to go, oh, he's not, he's not everything he's worked up to be. I'm going to knock people out. I'm going to sub people. I'm going to smash. I'm going to keep winning. And at the end of the day, when I'm sitting there and I got that belt eventually wrapped around my waist, I'm going to go, I told everybody I was right. I am I'm going to be one of the best to ever do this. I'm going to leave a legacy. And Ariel, on November 6th, I make my debut in the most iconic sports venue in the world. That's the way to start your, de your debut. That's the way to start the legacy. I love it. I love it. You're giving me goosebumps. What was your, what was your reaction when you got that word? Because like you could have debuted at the Apex or something, but Madison yeah. Square Garden, how did you react to that? Mm -hmm. Positive energy, magnetic energy. I said, I seen Kobe and Usman were headlining the event. Or Kobe, yeah, Kobe Newsman, and I was like, Madison, that's where I'm making my debut. That's where I'm making my debut. At the time, I was rewatching the uh, the Last Dance, and I seen that I was uh, just on the episode of Michael Jordan. Where he's like, the, the, the um, it's my first time at the Garden. I wore these Jordans. The last time at the, the Garden, I'm gonna wear these Jordans. And I was like, that's energy. I'm listening to it. I'm watching Michael Jordan. Then this fight gets announced. Like, that's the fight I'm going to be on. That's the card I'm going to make my debut on. Then we got the confirmation, and I was buying um, new shin pads um, in Vegas. And I just my my, my fiance runs up to me, and goes, "Oh my god, oh my god, MSG!" And I was like, "Get in!" I said it. I called it. I called it. So yeah, I, that was. Uh, do you know what? I I love Vegas, and I would be happy for it to be in Vegas. But the fact that it's the most iconic venue in the world, sports venue. It's I can't say I can't say it any other way. It's the best way to start this new chapter and this legacy. Oh, it's incredible. What a spot. I mean, that is prime real estate. Uh, you just said something that will disappoint a lot of people. And I was wondering, because I was like, is that the right hand or is that the left hand? Your fiance. So you do have a ring on your finger over there, right? Uh, it's yeah. Like, yeah. So you're you're engaged. Yeah. Yeah, I am. 23 yeah. UFC engaged. When did that happen? You know, when did it happen? <laughs> I mean, life's, life's gone pretty fucking fast there over yes. the last couple of months. <laughs> um, it's been pretty crazy. Um, yeah, like even saying, oh, just, yeah, just before my, um, just before my world title fight. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, she's amazing. You know what I mean? Like she's, she's part of the reason I showed up to that event. Like 100%. Like there was, I was sat at home. We were sat in our apartment and I was like, Look, maybe I don't think this is the smartest thing to do. Like, I have just lost my team. I have got a torn piece out. I haven't trained. Like, I had a two and a half week training camp for a world title fight. Maybe it's best that we just, like, maybe the energy is telling us not to fight. And she goes, yeah. And she told me to grab my wallet because in my wallet, I have this little thing that we got when we went out on a date one night and it was uh, from a, a fortune cookie. And I know it's a load, of, a load of shite, but in it, it says, it was a quote that says, to, to know what is right and not do it is worse than cowardice. 
And I saved it because it was a special night where we went out on a date. And this, so like, she goes, get you all that. And I pulled that out and I was like, oh, fuck uh-huh. you. Uh-huh. I was sitting there going, oh, you know exactly. And that was it. Ever since that, that moment, head was down. And yeah, she's amazing. And I'm lucky to have her by my side. She works harder than anyone I know. And she motivates me. So she inspires me. Uh, she works in my field as well. Uh, can I say yes, she, who your yeah. fiance is? Of course, can, yeah. Yeah, uh, Layla, who works for uh, Cage. She's done some presenting for Cage Warriors, all kinds of stuff. Yes. The, wrong? Am I wrong about that? Yeah, Layla, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and how did you guys meet? Well, like, I'm assuming maybe one of the cards that you were fighting on, right? Yeah, okay. yeah. We just built up. A, we just built up a friendship, and then eventually it ended up being being more than that. And, I couldn't be happier. And now you're engaged. Holy smokes. When's the yeah. wedding? That's a fucking good question. <laughs> I don't know. Let's get that. Let's get this debut and, and we'll see. I don't know. Ariel, do you know what? We could do it the day before. We could do it the next day. Who knows? I don't know. We're, um, we're out here with a purpose. That's to have the best debut that anyone's ever seen. And, and then we'll see. Do you, do you watch uh, Patty's debut on Saturday and say, look at everything that's happened since then, the byproduct of fighting in the UFC and all the attention and the Instagram follows all that stuff and say, Oh, I'm about to experience this in three months or two months from now. Like, do you, do you, do you look at that and say, I can't wait for that. And maybe on a grander scale, because it's MSG and all that stuff. Do you see that in, in cage warriors? I mean, there's a lot of similarities there. Yeah, hundred percent. Congrats to Patty. I mean, it was, it was an amazing performance. Um, congrats to all the guys. Obviously, I, I know a lot of them from um, obviously being around the Cage Warriors circuit, but um, yeah, like it's, it's brilliant to see that the fact that he goes in, has his debut, gets that much success. It's amazing. Obviously, I can't wait till that happens, but I've got to go in and do my job, and I've got to go in and put on a performance that's better than that mm. <laughs> because I want everybody to be talking about me. You know what I mean? Me and Patty might have this back and forth, like, who's the next big thing? We're going to find out. You know what I mean? I like Patty. I get along with a lot. We've done a lot of uh, voice notes. Layla actually runs a... A podcast called Voice Notes, and me and Paddy and Molly are always on it, and we're, we're always watching the fights live and talking. So we all have a great relationship. But at the end of the day, it's we've got to go in there and do our job and put on amazing performances. And I'm going to make sure that everyone's talking about me. Don't you worry. And what do you know about Jordan Williams, the man you'll be fighting in your debut? He's a tough fighter, but so is everybody in the UFC. Do you know what I mean? Again, like every that I'm going to go into. I'm going to be better than the person that's across the cage from me. I'm going to win and make a statement. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a statement and I'm going to leave MSG and I'm going to be like, right, the future is inevitable. Here I am. Enjoy. Get ready. Be excited because it's going to take off now and everyone's going to be sitting back going, who's this, what the, who's this kid? So yeah. I can't wait, my friend. Uh, it is very <laughs> exciting stuff. It's this nice young influx of talent uh patty did it you're about to do it um and and cage warriors is producing a lot of these uh these these fighters so kudos to them as well this has been a long time coming i'm happy we waited for today it feels like a lot of things are in order in your life so it's good that we waited for today congrats on all your success my friend uh, my best to your family congrats on the move to sanford congrats on the engagement the ufc contract the debut holy smokes a lot to be excited about <laughs> i'm sure on november 6 you'll be excited about a hell of a lot more as well so good luck in training great to meet you this way for the first time and thanks for doing this and i hope to do it again soon ariel i appreciate it. i appreciate all your support over the years it's going to keep rolling we're going to keep this hype train going i'm going to show everybody who the future is but i appreciate your time thank you and i hey look I'll be back after I win knockout at night on the, on November 6th. Don't you worry. I look forward to November 8th. We'll have you back on. I look forward to it, my friend. All the best to you, Ian. Thank you. Take care. It's a pleasure. All right. There he is. Ian Gary. Remember that name. Uh, you have these, uh, debuts on this show. Of course, the one that everyone has always talked about time and again has been, uh, you know, Connor's debut with the, uh, the blueberries. Uh, without a pot to piss in and you get you get a feeling that you know you watch a debut like that on this show and maybe we'll be talking about him in the same light in a few years time patty had a similar debut if memory serves me correct so uh great to have him on finally um and shout out to all those you know irish mma media members who do such a great job i don't know if any region in the world has talent and, and you know what maybe maybe i'm 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 wrong for saying this because obviously i don't speak every language so you know i don't speak portuguese read portuguese uh but 
man, Irish MMA media does a great job. And, uh, they're the ones who, you know, put me on to the likes of, uh, Ian Gary. Speaking of one of the very best great transition here. I didn't even plan this. Uh, want to give a shout out to my good friend, the Brazilian beast, Guilherme Cruz. My internet here is just so bad today. Like I'm clicking on, I, I might as well just go on my phone here. Um, just nothing even, I don't know what, it's probably my computer acting all crazy. Here it is. Guilherme Cruz just launched his own um, podcast that's in Portuguese, and I'm going to butcher the name. Maybe he can spell it out for me. Trocasau, Trocasau, Trocasau Franca, Trocasau Franca podcast. It's basically his uh, his own podcast uh, with, a, with a spotlight on Brazilian MMA, and I do believe uh, it's out, and I do believe his first uh, guest is the one and only Anderson Silva, who's returning to action this Saturday against Tito Ortiz. Trocasau, Trocasau, Sao. I think it's Sao. Franca. Hermes Franca? I don't think so. Brazilian MMA is tremendous as well. I do this every time. Every time I try to give someone props, I start to get all, oh, he's writing to me now. I start to get all nervous that I'm leaving someone else out. This happened a couple weeks ago when I was talking about, you know, American MMA media, or just general English MMA media. I, was like, oh, I forgot about that person and that person and that person. And now they're going to hate me. And now they're going to hate me. And now they're, uh, okay. He said, hey, he said I did it right. And I'm guessing you could get it wherever you get your podcast. So, if you're interested, uh, Guilherme is one of the OGs of the MMA fighting team, still kicking it, still the Brazilian beast. Uh, so, check it out if you are so inclined. Now, Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Tell me not to do it. I, 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 I mess up every time. All right, time now for everyone's favorite segment of the week. It is time for On the Nose. da 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 On the Nose, the segment where I answer some of your questions before we say goodbye. Arielhawani.substack.com. And boy, did this segment get a lot of love last week. I mean, holy smokes. Shout out to Jedi Goodman, uh, who doesn't work for me, who I've never actually met. I've never actually met him, but, uh, wow. What a loyal, what a loyal, uh, friend he is. I consider him a great friend. Um, and yeah, whoo, this segment took on a life of its own. Let me tell you. And so without further ado, let us go to the questions and let's see what you have in mind. <clears throat> and uh, you guys can, uh, you know, fire up, you know, the fryers in the back, a little orange chicken, a little, you know, give, give me some teriyaki, some Kung Pao, P.F. Chang's. Fire it up, baby. Let's go. David, which Englishman is next to achieve UFC gold in your opinion? Edwards, Allen, Aspinall, Pimlet or Till? Wow, that's a tough one. Edwards Allen. By the way, shout out to UK MMA as well. I mean, they're doing great things. Look at this. Look at this talent that they have. That's not naming all of them. That's just a few. Edwards Allen, Aspinall, Pimlet. I think Aspinall, maybe because there's less competition at heavyweight. Edwards is the closest. It's it's. It's a travesty he's not fighting for the belt next. Edwards could be that guy. Which Englishman is next to achieve USC gold? Edwards Allen. Allen could be that guy as well. He doesn't get enough love. A uh, bit of a busted hand at the moment. I'll go with Aspinall. How about that? And by the way, let me just say something about Darren Till. Tough loss for him. News comes out. His knee was messed up. Um, again, Darren is fighting the best of the best. And uh, in this sport, you can lose two, three in a row. You could get back on track, maybe take a step back. That would be my advice. Small step back. Not saying go and fight top 50 guys, but a small step back just to build yourself back up, your mojo. Um, but he has reached that status, and I know this is not what he ultimately wants. He has reached that status of the kind of guy who can lose one or two in a row. And by the way, he's fighting Robert Whitaker. He's fighting you know, Derek Brunson, who's so close to fighting for the belt. 
that he's going to be must see TV. He's going to be must see TV as long as he wants to be. Um, and so I hope he is not getting a lot of abuse. I hope he is not getting a lot of crap from people, especially online in this day and age. You put yourself out there, you stumble, you're going to get a lot of crap. Uh, I hope that's not the case because I still think Darren Till is a great fighter. And if, in fact, he was fighting with a torn ACL, I mean, God bless. Um, and that should take nothing away from Derek Brunson's win. His win and his run as of late has been amazing. Five in a row, fighting the best of the best, often being set up as a stepping stone and coming through in a very big way. Uh, Derek Brunson, one of the last remaining, if not the last remaining, guy that they brought over from Strike Force, you know, obviously some of the the women are doing great. Amanda Nunez, Misha Tate, etc. But hey, and she took a, a a long layoff. But Derek Brunson, ten years later, a guy that they hardly wanted, who had this ho hum um, debut against Chris Lieben, to still be kicking it, to still be doing great things, to be a contender. Ten years later, part of that Sanford MMA team, pretty remarkable. Love to have him on the show. Unfortunately, not allowed on the show. Uh, David Woods. Any word on Nathan Diaz and Jorge Masvidal's next opponents? Feels like we should be hearing about their next fights fairly soon. And is UFC 269 supposed to take place in Las Vegas? There seems to be hesitation to officially announce the location. No, I mean, that's the last I heard, but it's still December 11th, so a ways away. Who knows? Masvidal doesn't have an opponent yet. Uh, there had been some talk of him and Leon Edwards. Let's see if that comes through. That would be a big fight. Probably the only fight I think that Leon should take, if not for the belt, if he wants to stay active. Nathan is in an interesting spot. Can I just say something that's weird? Like, he has come out and said, give me Vicente Luque. I feel like that's a fight that Luque wants. In fact, Luque has called him out. And I feel like, obviously, that's a fight that you should make because if Luque wins, he gets a rub off Nathan. If Nathan wins, he's back on track. Feels like a win-win. And yet, for some reason, I'm seeing all these people talking about the trilogy fight with Connor. Of course, I would love to see the trilogy fight. But isn't it weird that Connor's going to be out for several months? if not a year from the time of his injury, and we're talking about the trilogy fight, why are we talking about a fight that could only be made in a year? We wouldn't, we're not trying to ice Nathan Diaz, right? We're not trying to do that, right? We're not trying to put someone on the sidelines who might be at the end of his contract, right? And who might have another big fight on the horizon. We would try to do that, right? Like we're not, we're not trying to kill him off against someone else, like a bad matchup, right? And bury him on you know, the undercard like UFC 70 and Andre Arlovsky, or was it 68? No, they wouldn't do that. So I think that they should do Nate Diaz versus uh, Vicente Luque. I feel like that's a fight. I mean, who says no to that fight? That's a tremendous fight. Tanner, with the news of Darren Till's ACL tear going into the fight and Connor claiming his issues going into the fight, can you explain what doctors actually do in their pre-fight checks? I mean, good question. It's it kind of hard, you know, to diagnose any, it's not like there's a cut or anything, so you can get around it, but yeah, it's crazy stuff. Now I'm sure they didn't want to be caught as well. So they're doing everything in their power to hide it. Uh, but these are tough, tough individuals. Um, God, this is a long message here from Cola. Hi, Ariel. Don't know if you remember me from many moons ago when you had Javier on your team. I remember Javier and you, uh, I was the first caller on your MMA hour show back in 1856. What? Uh, it was the week of the UFC event where Anderson Silva managed managed to beat. Why do you write 1856? Managed to beat Chael Sonnen in the last round of their fifth uh, match, and you asked the callers to ask about the fight specifically. I woke up at 6 a.m. calling from Australia. I missed your prep talk, so instead I had other plans. I ended up asking about who the top three Aussie fighters in the UFC at that stage were. And you were bitterly let down for me. I just wanted to say sorry for that. I apologize. <laughs> that was 10 years ago. Uh, now that I got that out of the way, let me get to this question. Do you know what day it is today? The 8th of September, 2021. It is National Pardon Day. So please pardon me for that phone call many, many years ago on your MMA Hour show. Apology accepted. Speaking of apologies. Anyway, uh, did you know it is? Uh, it was also National Quiet Day, so you had to actually celebrate that on Monday for not having a show on. Okay. Did you also know it's National Actors Day? Time to pay respect to all our actors out there that have kept us entertained. Amen. Most importantly, National Iguana Day. We used to have an iguana, the Hawani household. His name was Stimpy, and then he died. Let's pay homage to all the iguanas, including Stimpy, on Earth. 
My second question is, what, what, what's happened to your Mazda 6 I saw in your first YouTube video? I think that was my free agent. Fa this is bizarre. This is what you're asking me? The Mazda 6 on the first ever YouTube video that I ever posted? Uh, that, that was for a free agent fan video, I believe. And I think it was a rental. If memory serves me correct. And finally... Before I sign off, would you be interested in a boxing match with Joe Rogan to settle the misunderstanding? Imagine the money that could be made. Absolutely not. Joe's a beast. He trains. I'm happy he's feeling better. I'm not interested in a boxing match against him or anyone else, for that matter. So for all the jabronis who are lining up to call me out, I'm sorry. I'm not going to box you. And also, I don't want to box Joe Rogan. No, thank you. Uh, Will, if Dana White decided to make a 165-pound division tomorrow, which two realistic fighters would you schedule for the vacant title bout? Man, that's a tough one. Kevin Lee? Nate Diaz, probably the one who's been... Uh, I'd probably do Nathan Diaz. He's been campaigning for it the most. Hmm. Looking who's in the welterweight division. Nate would be a good one. Jorge would be an interesting one as well. How about Nate versus Jorge? How about Nate versus Dustin? I would love to see. I would love for it to go 155, 165, 175, 185. Even someone like Darren Till would be perfect for 175. A little too big for 70, a little too small for 85, 175. Have you listened to Dana White on the Travis Brown podcast talking about fighter pay, doing the typical Dana White thing? He specifically goes after the scumbag media for convincing fighters that they are worth more. Uh, I saw some clips. Shout out to Travis Brown. Didn't know he had a podcast until this, so that worked. Um, it's hilarious because you can say Dana will always resort to name calling. He'll always resort to insults, scumbag this, douche that, scumbag this, without ever actually backing anything up with facts. Here's the bottom line. It's not the media who's talking about this now. It's the actual fighters on ESPN in the in-ring interview. We've come a long way from people like me having to ask about it to now they're just offering it up. Or you see the reaction to a 50K bonus and all that stuff. So the media might be talking about it, but it's often now after the fact that these fighters are willingly bringing it up. And I give them a lot of props because they could get in trouble for bringing it up. So, you know, Jared Cannonier brought that up on his own. A lot of other fighters recently have brought it up on their own. Um, obviously, Jake Paul is talking about it. But this time, we're not at fault. Now, we may be writing about it, talking about it, but we're not the ones prying this stuff out of them. And we're also, by the way, talking to the guys who are saying they're happy, too. Who's on recently? Kevin Holland on recently. Happy clip so it's very easy to to point when the media are doing things that you're not happy about but the truth is this is all just about covering the sport there's no difference in covering this than in covering uh ben simmons wants out of philly or damian lillard wants a new contract so this is this has always been the issue the issue has always been if you're not talking about the next fight which by the way We've now had a three-hour show talking to Ian, Gary, and Patty, but like nothing negative, nothing bad. But you say one little thing, one two-minute clip about fighter pay because you want the fighters to make more money or be happy or are reacting to something they said about pay, and holy smokes, you're the worst person walking the face of the earth. You're a scumbag. You're a douche. That's not how this works. That's not how media works. 99.9% .9 of it is positive. It's always been positive. It's always been shining a positive light on the fighters and the sport and the UFC and the brand. But there's going to be some other things that you got to talk about. That's just the cost of covering a sport. That's the cost of being media. That's the cost of this whole thing that we're doing. It happens in the NBA, the NFL. Cam Newton gets cut and this and that and salary cap. and that. like That's just sports. It's not personal. It's sports. Now, maybe pers personal to the fighters who want to get paid more, but for us, it's not personal. So, but then it always goes, per it's always personal on their end. Scumbag, scumbag, bad people, bad people. They're the ones talking about it. We're the ones reacting to it or writing about what they're talking about. Why is it our fault? Easy to blame us, not our fault. As a proud Canadian, this is from Jake. Do you love Tim Hortons? Yes, I do. Um, if so, favorite item? Coffee is great. 
Timbits. Uh, from Simon, any idea when we'll see Crone Gracie fighting again? Yeah, that's been a weird one. Haven't heard much from Crone. Hard guy to reach. I'll look into it. Uh, much love from Australia, from Marty. Are you still playing around with the Twitter spaces thing? They were a good crack up between prelims on a main card. Um, and main card? On a main card? Uh, no, I'm not doing Twitter spaces. I'm doing Spotify Green Room. Check it out. Friday and Saturday. We're back on Friday. P.S. Congrats on the new weatherman job. And so there it is. There's the first entry. What an interesting... <laughs> I mean, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much for the... Uh, the congratulations. I don't get that one. And so I know a lot of you now want to hear my take on uh, Brendan's segment about me yesterday, I think it was. Um, and yes, of course I saw it. I don't play the certain type of game that he plays where he pretends like he doesn't see things. And then he's like, oh, I don't run my social media. Oh, I didn't see this. Oh, I heard this. No, no, we know you run your social media. We know you see everything. We know that you're aware of everything and are just kind of playing it up, and that's fine. I guess it's a good gimmick. I don't get the Weatherman thing. I honestly don't. In fact, that was the first time I heard about it. Um, I, 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 is it an insult? Does it mean like we're sometimes right, sometimes wrong? I mean, it would be somewhat ironic considering the source, sometimes right, sometimes wrong. Uh, I, I like to pride myself on being always right. Um, so I don't get that one, and obviously that's not what I'm mad about because I didn't bring that up yesterday and i'm not even mad and so i'll go back to the previous point that i made at the top of the show i knew he was never going to apologize i know that wasn't even a sincere apology that i got on text it's because i tweeted about it on a wednesday several days later and there was a code word in there about a reddit page that love him dearly and then only afterwards 12 hours later did i get the quote-unquote apology and then i said all right are you going to do this Publicly, because you, you know, said some lies about me publicly, so it seems like the natural place. Of course I knew he wasn't going to come back and be as sincere as he was on this text on camera. He can't do that. And so the, the funniest thing about the whole thing is I'm watching this segment. He doesn't even bring it up. His boy Brian bring, brings it up, who continued to say, Ariel so sensitive, Ariel so sensitive, Ariel so sensitive, Ariel so sensitive. Newsflash for Brian, who I've never met before other than the time that he's been on this podcast. What makes you think I'm so sensitive? Is it because I'm annoyed that for the, for the past like five, six years, you guys keep saying these lies about me and I've never even responded once? Let me ask you this, because he kept saying on the show, we're in different lanes, almost like he's, you know, he's above, he's in a different lane, he's doing other things, right? He's, you know, he's a comedian, he's a podcaster, he's got all these shows, he's doing great. Let me ask you this, for those that watch both shows, how many times have you heard me talk about his show, him, on this show, or any other show that I've ever done? The ESPN shows, DC, Chael, MMA Hour, how many times have you heard me react to anything that has ever been said on this show from his show? How many times have you heard me talk about the state of his career? How many times have you heard me say, oh, I saw something on that show. Let me talk about this on my show. How many times? I'm going to guess zero. There might, maybe, I'm going to say, to be fair, maybe once, I think wholeheartedly zero. Now let me ask you, how many times does he talk about me? How many times has he reacted to something that's going on in my life? My job situation, right? The behind the scenes. Let me tell you how it really is behind the scenes. Who cares more about who in this equation? For someone who wants to come out and say that he doesn't care about me and doesn't pay attention to me and has nothing to do with me and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a byproduct of some drone strike, I have no idea what the hell is he talking about. Is he mad at someone? Because then come out and say it. If you want to be a shooter from the hip, then come out and say it. I'm a byproduct. I don't know what the F you're talking about, but I know that you like to talk about me a lot. You like to talk about my, my career, my comings and goings behind the scenes. Who likes me? Who doesn't like me? Who wants to work with me? Who doesn't want to work with me? It's a weird thing to say you don't care, different lanes, but yeah, you're always talking about me. That's strange. And yet I never talk about you. So who's the sensitive one? Who's the one who's actually bothered by all of this? It's not jealousy, right? That can't be. We're in different lanes. So what is it? I don't get it. 
And it's a weird thing because it's like, all right, you're saying that, you know, I'm a byproduct. I'm by Everything you said was about me, no one else. So who are you talking about? Who do you have a beef with? Why are you always talking about me? That's the part that I don't understand. And so, so even afterwards, like after I was on McAfee, you know, I, I, I got a text. Hey, man, uh, you know, I don't want a war. You don't want a war, right? And they're like, no, you, very nice on text, pleasant on text. But then when we get to the show, it's stammering. It's, it's having your friends set it up. It's taking little pot shots. So which one is it? Who's the real Brendan? That's what I want to know. Who's the real guy? I remember when I was removed from the Showtime gig for Mayweather McGregor. I remember when that happened. And you were very kind to me. You came up to me in the hotel in Toronto. I remember that vividly. And you said how, how messed up it was and all this stuff. And then I remember your show the following week and how you took some shots and how you said we did kind of the same thing. You didn't really understand why I was there. And I was like, wow, that's not the same tone. That's totally different than when I heard at the, at the hotel. So you're not two-faced, right? Like you're not playing an act here and then on your show playing a different act, right? Which is the real guy. I keep a 100 here. It's Hiawani all day, every day. Same guy. You could say all you want about me being an instigator, a potter. You could call me sensitive. You could do this and that. But I'm the same dude. And you know what's funny? After I had that little rant last week, let's play this game now. How many people reached out to you when you said I was tough to work with? How many people reached out to you privately and said, oh, I've had some bad experiences with that guy? Because I could tell you how many people reached out to me after I had to say a few things last week. That's weird, right? So again, like the great Dennis Green once said, they are who we thought they were. You are, you guys are, who I thought you were. You're going to sit there and be like, he's the best, he's the this, he's the that, but then pot shot, pot shot, pot shot. And, and what was that part that you took out? What was that part? You want to beat me up? You're, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna go to the lowest common denominator. You're, you know, you're a comedian now. You're a pot. You got a great gig. You want to beat me up? The guy with the glasses, the guy with the suit. That's what we're resorting to. Something, by the way, that some of the toughest human beings that I've had on this show, who sometimes don't like me, have never resorted to. But that is that the part that they took out, threatening me. You want me to come to LA? You, should we do some, some bench presses? What should we do? Should we do some push-ups? What, what, what were you implying there? I don't know. I don't know what all this is about. I'm sure in a while I'll get a text. Hey, bro, I don't want to fight. But isn't your guy who works on your show talking about my family on his Instagram? He is, right? Talking about my family. That's the kind of people you guys are. Fake, phony, and everyone knows who you are now. You have been outed. Everyone knows. And maybe I shined a bit of a spotlight on it, but everyone knows your whole gimmick. Brian Cowan, don't talk about me. You know nothing about me. Who are you talking about? I'm sensitive. Based on what? Based on what? This might be the first time I've ever said your mouth other than the time you were on my show. You got enough going on, my man. Don't talk about me. Brent, done with you, man. Brendan, done with you. The other dude sitting next to me pretending not to know who I am when we all know that whole thing was concocted. Done with you guys. I'm over it. I'm moving on. If you want to apologize, great. But it means nothing to me. I felt like I was watching the scene from Billy Madison where he's rambling on, and that's the clip that I posted yesterday. It was an incoherent, fake segment that I expected, and then some. It was useless. We all knew it was coming. We all predicted it. You're not sorry. You double down. You don't like me. I don't care. Enjoy your little podcast. Enjoy your little comedy sets. It's all a bit. It's all. That's what I love about comedians. They'll make fun of you. They'll say so. It's just a bit. It's just a joke, bro. It's just a joke. Get out of here with this nonsense. Fake, phonies, two-faced. That's who you guys are. That's exactly who you guys are. And everyone knows it. You're not doing yourselves any favors. You sit back on your little chair. Let me tell you how it was for Ariel at ESPN. Let me tell you what happened in the bed. You know nothing. You know less than nothing. Stop talking about my career. And if you're going to go to one source who has some distorted beef with me that was a 1,000% wrong, reveal your source, Bubba. Reveal it. Don't start talking about a million people. Nonsense. So again, I've just wasted 20 minutes on this. High Road Helwani would be shattered. He would say, you're wasting time. You're punching down. There is no high road Helwani anymore. 
It's the Heelwani era. And, uh, and, and, and for everyone who says, you wouldn't say this to his face, of course I would. I'm not looking to fight anyone. I'm an actual civilized human being. But ask a couple of my friends in Cleveland who had issues with me over the past year and a half if I went right up to their face. If I walked up to their face when they were trying to look, ask them if I'm that kind of guy. Ask Ben Askren, ask Donald Cerrone, people in the past who have had issues with me. Do I go up to your face and try to settle beefs? Absolutely. Even when I was being banned and the story that he doubled down on again, the whole narrative. I don't even think he knows the, I don't even think he knows the definition of the word narrative. Honestly, I think he doesn't know the definition of the word narrative. It's the whole narrative that the whole community is talking about. Who are these people? One dude, you have one source who got it from the one guy who tried to change the story. Enough. The jig is up, guys. Phony, fake, two face. You could keep doubling down, triple down, quadruple down. I'm not worried about it. You're not going to hurt me. You, you tried to hurt me going into the Jake Paul fight. It, it's good. I'm here, independent, on a little island, all by myself. I'm Gucci, man. I'm Gucci, as the kids say. I'm good. So you can make up all the stories that you want. But rest assured, we all know, and we all expected this. We know who you are. You're not fooling anyone. Well, he's the best in the business, but he's damn sensitive. Based on what, Brian? Based on what? Based on what, Brendan? Based on what? Byproduct? I'm not the one who shoots from the hip? Really? I'm not the one? Why don't you shoot from the hip? Who are you so mad at? Who was that drone strike for? Who are you so mad at? If it wasn't about me, why don't you shoot from the hip? Go ahead. We're all waiting. You won't. You won't. So that's that. I mean, one pathetic segment that was sitting back there and listening to that. Like, really? This is what we waited a week for? You could have sent out a tweet and saved us a hell of a lot of time. Just do me a favor. Leave my name out of your mouth. Leave my family's name out of your mouth. Don't talk about them. Don't, don't throw your minions under the bus when they talk about them. Just let's go our separate ways now, all right? I've never had a negative thing to say about you, your show, your experiences, all that. I've never said a thing when everyone piled on about your comedy and all that stuff. Never said a thing. And now you want to keep talking about my career. And then when you get called out, say, oh, he was just a byproduct. Get out of here with that nonsense. Stop talking about me. Last warning. Done. And I won't go on a media tour to talk about you. I regret it, honestly, going on McAfee's show the next day to talk about you. Because you know what? Like you told me a long time ago, true story. Ask Brendan to come on my show a long time ago. You know what he said? A long, long time ago. I have a podcast. Why should I go on other people's? All right. I was like, all right. Now I know what's up. I don't have that mentality. I like to spread the love, spread the wealth. And so I'm happy to go on Patrick's show. But I'm done with it now. Enough. Go back to your jokes, go back to your little bits, and your 50 podcasts that no one listened to. All right. Uh, thoughts on the AEW stuff? All Out was pretty nuts. It was fantastic. I loved All Out. I think the uh, the wrestling business is on fire, like I said. I love the fact that there's you know, another option for the guys. People are showing up. We know that they're showing up. We know that they're coming, and we're still excited about it. And then you'll get the... The Adam Coles of the world show up? Amazing. Pro wrestling is on fire, and I'm happy. Suggestion from Michael. The Pimlet bandwagon is in motion. I'm on board. I feel like you are too. Surely the name needs to be the Paddy Wagon, or maybe the Bad Wagon. Jeez, keen to get your thoughts. Paddy Wagon? Paddy Wagon is fantastic. You need to run with that. Can you trademark that for us, please? Paddy wagon. That is fantastic. Uh, Helwani. You always have the perfect all-around buzz cut. Are you the barber, or do you get to cut it every week, asking for a friend? I'm the barber. I used to go to a barber every week. Great guys. Pandemic. I said, you know what? Let me do this on my own. Let me do this on my own. And you know what? I kind of like it on my own. Could do when I want at night, in the morning. I don't have to be beholden to, I, I don't, this is the end. So I usually go Thursday to Thursday. So this is the end. Tomorrow I'll probably, you know, 
shave it down, and two days later, it pops back up. It's like a Chia Pet. Pops back up. But I appreciate that. It made me feel really good. Um, why don't we get a card in Denver? I mean, pandemic. But I feel like you guys have had a lot of cards in Denver, if I'm being honest. Saul, has a fighter ever asked you to walk to the ring with them? No. That has never happened. Thomas, do you have a go-to fight to show your friends or family who are not fans of MMA but are interested? Great question. Um, not a lot of people have asked me that, but I would show them like Jones Gustafson one. I would show them Hendo Shogun one. Um, maybe a Korean zombie fight. Those are the top two. When is the MMA beat coming back? Stay tuned. When is the next UFC event you'll be covering in person? I don't know. Three pack on the ground. Stay tuned. Uh, do you have a favorite fighter? My first favorite fighter growing up was David Loazzo. Um, he's from Montreal, went to school uh, nearby. And uh, that was the first. But, you know, once I got into it, of course, there's guys that you like. There's guys that you have an affinity for, a connection with. But I try not to root for fighters because I don't think that that is, uh, you know, that is my job. Okay, just a couple more. Better UFC debut, Patty or Connor? Man, that's tough. I mean, I, I would have to say Connor because he didn't get hit. And I know he says he likes it, but, you know, that was pretty flawless. Um, with all the hype, is this finally the year for the Buffalo Bills? It is. It absolutely is. A little bit louder now. 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 Hey, 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 these are the things that make me happy. These are the things that get me excited. The Buffalo Bills being back. The New York Knicks about to win the Eastern Conference title, led by the great Kemba Walker. The Blue Jays on fire. Life is good. In addition to all the important stuff like friends, family, health, all that. You know, my sports teams are doing pretty well. Finally, uh, would you ever do an on to the next one or another podcast with Mike Heck and Alex K. Lee? Of course not. Absolutely. I've been on it recently. Um, I love the post show with Chuck and Pizzi. Will you ever do Twitter spaces from another person? No, Spotify green room. Gadooshed. I address that. Great performance at the Jake Paul Woodley fight. Just wanted to let you know how awesome it was to see you in the ring doing your thing. How do you think Laura Sanko did commentating contender series last night? She's great. She's a natural. She deserves it. She had a great breakdown and analysis. I agree. Um, biggest MMA what if Fedor Brock also Fedor Randy Couture one more one more I read that one I read that one I read that one Um, I read that one how many fights until Patty gets a ranked opponent I'll say three. It's going to be a lot of buzz. Keeps winning. I'll say three to four, something like that. But what a debut. What a time to be alive. Shout out to everyone who sent in questions. Arielhawani.substack.com. Alas, we have gone a little longer than I would like to, but we only have one show this week. So I gave you a little something, something to chew on. Back next week with the usual Monday, Wednesday layout. So uh, don't expect me to stick around till 4.30 ever again because if I'm being honest, I'm too old for this. Frank, you can hit my music. Did I uh, did I knock over the uh, the mic? Or did I do a better job? You know, if, yeah, once or twice. You know what? If I'm being honest, I can't do much better than that. Oh, you know, I, I have not done fantasy football in 15 years, my friends, 15 years, but I promised a neighbor that I would do it this year. Why? I don't know. I'm regretting it. My draft is in two and a half hours. I know nothing about fantasy football or really anything other than the Buffalo Bills. So my strategy is going to be just draft Bills players. I have the last pick. I'm just going to draft Josh Allen, Stephon Diggs, Devin Singletary. This probably won't work out well for me when they have a bye, but I don't really care. And so I felt like I needed to get that off my chest to someone. Can't say it to my wife. She doesn't care. So I felt like, you know, maybe 1% of you out there care. And so here we are. What a fun day. What a fun time to be alive.
Triller this weekend, guys. Are you excited? I'm excited. I'm not excited, actually. I think it's crazy that Evander Holyfield is actually fighting against Vitor Belfort, and I'm actually kind of worried about it. I am excited to see Anderson Silva back, but I'm a little bit worried about the whole thing, if I'm being honest. And now Donald Trump involved. I mean, it's going to be a total train wreck. I think we'll have a lot to talk about on Monday. For now, though, let us say goodbye. Thank you very much to all our guests. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you very much to Jack Shore. Congrats to him. Get well soon. Thank you very much, Molly McCann. Congrats to her. Thank you very much, Tom Aspinall. Great stuff. Thank you very much, Anthony Smith. Good luck to him. Thank you, Patty Pimblett. And good luck to the great Ian Gary as well. Thanks to all of you. Back next week, same time and place. Until then, I say peace. I'm out of here.